Department and the Ohio State University Sustainability Institute, I want to welcome you to the Understanding Algal Bloom State of the Science Conference. First today, I wanna to thank you all for attending. The total registration is a bit under 900. So while we're all tired of COVID and online meetings, there's some silver linings in that we can reach a large audience. In contrast, our in-person meetings typically had an attendance of around 300. Uh, we have reviewed the registrations and I was amazed at the breadth of locations and organizations. And I did wanna give you a sense of the organizations involved. We have government agencies from counties, cities, states, with more than 26 United States um, included and four countries represented. These include organizations and individuals that reach across researchers, educators, students, nonprofits, foundations, private industry, health professionals, journalists, private citizens, and more. There's several state agencies from Ohio that are represented as well. And we're now going to have some short welcomes and updates from some of these agencies. We're going to begin with Eric Sass from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Go ahead, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us here. Uh, I'm Eric Sass. I'm the H2 Ohio Program Manager for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And I'm here today representing a, over two dozen uh, staff at ODNR who are working on a daily basis to move forward our H2 Ohio water quality initiative. And that's part of um, Governor DeWine's vision for clean water as a moral imperative for Ohioans. And our part is restoring wetlands with a water quality focus. And we're proud to have engaged directly with the academic community and, and helping us monitor the results of our, of our projects, uh, sharpen our blade and adjust our sights on addressing the water quality issues of our time. So as we continue to ask tough questions and learn, we are very proud to be part of this conversation today. Thank you for including us. Thank you very much, Eric. Next, we have Joy Mullenix from the Lake Erie Commission. Good morning. Um, again, thank you for including the state of Ohio. Um, we want to thank the grant and the Ohio State University and um, NRCS, everyone who was involved in organizing the conference um, from the state's perspective, we find it really helpful to keep up with um, all of the research going on in this field. Um, I am the director of the Ohio Lake Erie Commission and our role on algal blooms has been to help coordinate with our fellow agencies here in Ohio. Um, so Dr. Sandra Kosick-Sills has been um, leading the charge on Ohio's domestic action plan here at the commission, and that involves work with all of our partner agencies. Um, we're also part of the H2 Ohio team, and as Eric just laid out, this is um, our uh, governor's effort to um, make inroads into nutrient reduction in the Western Lake Erie Basin. And um, the commission is uh, partnering with some of the researchers um, on developing um, improvements to SWOT models. Um, so we will um, also um, be looking forward to the information um, in the coming years on um, how H2 Ohio is um, impacting uh, the nutrient loads into the Lake Erie Basin. Um, we have also been a part of um, the Ohio State and University of Toledo's efforts on um, harmful algal bloom research initiative, um, as well as working on Annex 4. Um, so there's so much work going on in this space. And um, again, appreciate um, all of the organization that went into bringing us together so that we could hear more. Thank you. Joy, thank you so much. And thanks for supporting the important research. Um, next, we're planning to include remarks from Jean Phillips from the Ohio Department of Health, if Jean is online. Okay, it appears Jean isn't with us. We were hoping to include him, but we knew that he had a tight schedule this morning, so uh, we're going to skip over Jean Phillips. I will point out that in the afternoon program, Terry Mesher from the Ohio Department of Agriculture and Tiffany Kavalek from the Ohio 
Environmental Protection Agency will include updates uh, from those two state agencies. Next, I wanna thank and recognize several elected officials from federal, state, and county level, levels in attendance today. Thanks for your interest and support of policies to combat, to combat algal blooms. I'm very happy to have representation from agricultural groups, businesses, industry, consulting firms, agencies, NGOs, and elected officials. As we search for win-win solutions, it's vital to have all interested groups working together. Again, thank you all for coming. It's great to have so many interested in learning about and addressing harmful algal blooms. Um, it's also important that we thank those who made this event possible. First of all, I wanna thank our speakers for preparing, practicing and presenting their talks, and most importantly, for leading research and outreach focused on algal bloom. Um, today, because we have a online meeting, we have no sponsors, but I wanna thank the past sponsors for this event and also warn them that we might come calling again uh, when we can support an in-person meeting. I wanna thank the co-chairs who I'm lucky to work with to plan this event. These include Dr. Kristen Fussell and Chris Winslow from Ohio Sea Grant, Dr. Kevin King from USDA ARS, and Greg Labarge from OSU Extension. Important thanks are also directed to Jared Morrison, Shalise Simmons, Amy Kometscher, and Summer McLean from OSU Extension who have supported the registration online venue um, I also want to thank key support from Ohio Sea Grant that was essential for this event, and that includes Aaron Monaco and Jill Gentis, among others. Bottom line, it takes a lot of people and groups to make this meeting happen, and it makes it all worthwhile to have an event like this. Because this meeting focuses on land and water, it's also appropriate to have an acknowledgement of the previous and current inhabitants of the Western Lake Erie Basin. I would like to acknowledge the land and waters of the Western Lake Erie Basin are the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Anishinaabeg, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, and the Erie, Haudenosaunee, Mississauga, Kaskaskia, Miami, Peoria, Kickapoo, Fox, Caldwell, and other indigenous peoples. I want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that has and continues to affect the indigenous peoples of this land. Acknowledging this history does not change the past, but a thorough understanding of its ongoing unjust consequences can empower us to create a more and just future. Now I'd like to briefly review the plans for today. We have two sessions, a morning and afternoon session. The morning session does include four presentations, each followed by questions for that individual presenter and this will conclude around 11.35. After a lunch break, the afternoon session will start at 12.30 and also includes four presentations that will be followed by questions for each presenter. And this will conclude around 2.30. Thanks to those who have already submitted questions through the registration link. Uh, we also invite you to use the chat function to submit additional questions during the event. These questions will be directed to the host and then Chris Winslow and Kristen Fussell will consolidate and ask questions to each speaker following their presentation. Because of the limited time we have, we anticipate not being able to ask all questions, and we do apologize for this time constraint. Um, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping for this virtual event. Uh, because of a large audience of almost 900, all attendees will be muted. Um, you can only use your chat chat function to submit questions. The Q&A is turned off. The meeting is being recorded and will be available at the Ohio Sea Grant events page afterwards. And you can also access a live transcript of the event on Zoom if desired. Um, I also invite you to review the code of conduct and you can find this on the Sea Grant event webpage where you registered. One request is that I strongly encourage you to complete the post-conference survey that will be emailed to you shortly after the event. Uh, we do want to keep this event relevant and current and meet your needs. Uh, specific questions um, are the focus of future topics of this and future meetings. Uh, with a one-day meeting, we obviously can't address all the topics. Um, 
One question, if COVID permits, we are considering having an in-person meeting in the future, but maybe you prefer online. So please let us know what you think about future meetings. And I will highlight that we do review your responses. Lastly, uh, I have one announcement of upcoming events and I wanna make sure you're all aware of the State of Lake Erie Conference, which is going to be held in Cleveland on March 16th through 18th in 2022. Uh, the topics will obviously focus on Lake Erie and they, were sh they will surely include algal blooms and much more. Uh, this will be a fantastic event and we encourage your participation. Now I'm going to open our first session and introduce our morning speaker, Dr. Hans Pearl. Hans is a Keenan Professor of Marine and Environmental Sciences at UNC Chapel Hill Institute for Marine Sciences. He's the ideal plenary speaker for this event because he is a world leader in the science and management of algal blooms and coastal eutrophication. His research, his research examines nutrient over enrichment and he develops nutrient management strategies to control eutrophication and algal blooms in large lake and estuarine ecosystems in the US, China, Europe, and other regions. Uh, besides authoring many of the seminal papers on these subjects, he's also received awards, which I will highlight just a couple. These include the G. Evelyn Hutchinson Award from the, from the Association of Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography, and the 2011 Odom Award for the Coastal, from the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation for addressing causes, consequences, and controls of eutrophication. So thank you, Hans, for the important research you're leading. And we also thank you for your plenary presentation titled, Where Do We Go From Here? mitigating harmful cyanobacterial blooms in a world facing human nutrient overrichment and climate change. Take it away, Hans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay and Chris. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, great. And uh, hopefully you can see the full screen. And um, yep. so away we go. Um, first of all, I, yeah, I wanted to thank everyone at Ohio Sea Grant in, uh, in the neighborhood for inviting me. Um, I have become uh, a lot more uh, clued into some of your problems having uh, served with uh, on the uh, OHH uh, program that's uh, run through the Bowling Green State University and uh, we're part of that. And I'm gonna show you some of the results that we've gotten from looking at nutrient uh, interactions with the blooms in uh, Lake Erie. But I also want to stress uh, sort of the global importance of this issue. So we're kind of got to kind of sort of, you know, surf around to different uh, uh, settings uh, to hopefully give you some idea of where we're at in terms of understanding the relationship between nutrient inputs and the uh, increases in cyanobacterial blooms that we're seeing worldwide. And I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of my colleagues, some of whom are on this call actually for having been involved with me in looking at some of these uh, issues. So uh, the first part, I think everyone's pretty familiar with, but we'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, you know, cyanobacteria are um, uh, clearly um, linked to increased human activities, uh, population growth, et cetera. And uh, I, want to, I wanted to just stress the uh, importance of that in the context of, uh, of the talk that I'll be giving uh, in that I'll be talking about you know, the obvious things, increased nutrient loading inputs uh, that are linked to increased algal blooms. I want to stress both nitrogen and phosphorus. And I think we'll have some speakers talking about those specific nutrients following myself. But also water use and hydrologic modifications play uh, important roles. And that links us to climate change, uh, which is certainly uh, an issue these days, uh, both in terms of uh, increased temperatures, warming, but also the change in hydrologic cycling uh, that is um, playing a very important role in these blooms, uh, both intensifying and spreading. Um, let me see if I can change here. Okay, so the one thing I wanted to emphasize was that um, um, the, um, let me just change the color here to red, to a red pen here, uh, hopefully, or a pen anyway. I wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, cyanobacterial blooms traditionally have been sort of associated with freshwater issues, uh, lakes, reservoir streams, et cetera. 
but they really are also an issue in estuarine and coastal waters. And that is becoming increasingly um, common with climate change issues like large floods, et cetera, that are driving these blooms into estuarine and coastal systems. So just want to get that in everybody's head that we're not just talking about um, lakes, streams, and inland waters, but also coastal systems uh, that are increasingly uh, becoming uh, impacted. OK, what drives these blooms? Uh, one of the things that I think uh, is really important uh, to recognize is that obviously nutrients play an important role. And you can see the nitrogen and phosphorus arrow there. But also physics play an incredibly important role as well. Uh, temperature, stratification in the water, uh, residence time, that is the flow of fresh water coming in through a system, uh, the changes that we see between high flow and low flow. Uh, and then, of course, the cyanobacteria themselves have habits that can take advantage of a lot of these issues that I'll be talking about, including stronger stratification uh, in uh, ecosystems that are impacted by the blooms because they're able to migrate vertically in the water column. So they essentially pick their spot uh, where they like to optimize their growth. That's one of the problems when a bloom gets started because if you have a lot of surface blooms, obviously they're gonna shade the underlying water column, which gives the cyanobacteria competitive edges over uh, other plankton and also macrophytes and uh, benthic uh, uh, microalgae and benthic plants. And then lastly, their ability to migrate up and down allows them to, to essentially take up nutrients from the uh, sediments uh, at night or in the evening, or for that matter, anytime, but uh, at night when they're not photosynthesizing. And then, of course, they bloom during the day, taking advantage of the high light. And they have good protective capabilities for dealing with high light as well. And then lastly, there are an issue with regard to the food web. Uh, many of the cyanobacteria are not eaten readily, so they're kind of a dead end in the food web in that regard. And then, uh, so, you know, you can sort of see the internal cycling here. The blooms start, uh, they die, uh, their nutrients are in the sediments, but then as blooms perpetuate and new blooms form, essentially they can take advantage of the nutrients and uh, organic matter that was deposited from previous blooms. So cyanobacteria are smart. They've been around for a long time, uh, over 2 billion years. And uh, clearly they're taking advantage of what we are doing in the watershed, but also other things that are going on, including climate change. I wanted to start off with sort of the, uh, the poster child of these blooms, uh, Lake Taihu in uh, China, where I've worked for about, uh, gosh, uh, must be getting close to 15 years now. This uh, system essentially uh, went from a uh, oligomesotrophic system dominated by diatoms back uh, all the way back to the 1980s. And then in a relatively short period of time, ended up uh, switching to a cyanobacteria dominated system. Very much linked to expansion of cities and towns around the lake, but also increased agricultural inputs of nutrients. And now the blooms, which are dominated by microcystis, which uh, many of you in the Lake Erie area are infinitely familiar with, uh, this is the same organism that's uh, essentially causing problems in Erie and other uh, systems. We now have microcystis blooms that last uh, nine months in Taihu, and they can even overwinter. And sometimes if the weather's good in the winter, you might even see a bloom then. So big things have changed in this system. I did want to emphasize microcystis because A, it is very common in other systems having problems with uh, blooms and toxicity. And secondly, it is a non-nitrogen fixer. So it requires nitrogen from uh, external sources or internally recycled nitrogen. And we'll get back to that issue um, in a minute. So when we do what are called bioassays, where we essentially ask the algae okay, which nutrients are limiting your growth at any one particular time? Uh, we have done a lot of these in Taihu uh, where we use uh, cubitainers. I think many of you have used them in experimental work as well. They're incubated in C2 after nutrient additions and then comparing that to the control. And when we look at the stimulation of growth as chlorophyll A uh, through two seasons here or two years uh, seasonally, 
in uh, Taihu, you can see that uh, relative to the control in the spring, uh, you get pretty good stimulation by phosphorus. Uh, and then, uh, but then later uh, in the year, we see stimulation by nitrogen and not so much by phosphorus. And this repeats itself in the um, following year. Again, phosphorus stimulation in the spring, uh, followed by nitrogen in the uh, summertime. But the thing I really want to point out is that if you add both nutrients together, you usually get more than just the effect of the single nutrient. So this sort of points out the two things. One is uh, there can be seasonal differences in nutrient limitation uh, by uh, phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, but secondly, there is a strong sort of co-limitation by both nutrients, particularly when you have the shift from, uh, from spring into summer. So this sort of hints at nutrient co-limitation of these uh, blooms. And uh, this is sort of my politician slide, people that don't like to look at data. Uh, when you filter 100 milliliters of uh, lake water uh, that's been bioassayed uh, after a 48 hour incubation, here's the control up here, uh, triplicate controls, uh, nitrate addition, phosphate addition, and NNP. And this uh, clearly mirrors what we see in the real data. Uh, N is important, P is important, but N and P together probably are the most important. So the next question obviously is, okay, how much do we need to reduce the inputs of these nutrients in order to um, achieve some sort of control of the blooms or at least um, manage them from uh, proliferating even worse? And we've been working uh, on these nutrient dilution bioassays for quite a long time where we dilute the lake water uh, or whatever system you're assaying with a what's called a major ion solution that has everything in it except nitrogen and phosphorus at different dilutions. And then we add back the nutrients individually to these treatments uh, to see which nutrient is limiting and at what concentration it was limiting. And when you do that in Taihu, you clearly see that in the um, spring, Phosphorus uh, can be limiting, uh, but you have to reduce the uh, actual concentration of phosphorus by 30 to 50 percent or so to have limitation. And with nitrogen later in the summer, it, it's even greater, 50 to 70 percent. So these numbers are pretty big in terms of uh, you know what the reductions need to be. But when you go back and look at historic increases in loading of these nutrients, these numbers actually. Uh, match quite well in terms of how much we have increased the nutrient loads for these nutrients in the systems themselves. Uh, so I think we have fairly good confidence that these nutrient dilution bioassays can uh, A, point out which nutrients are limiting, but also B, what the targets are likely to be for reduction of these nutrients to control the blooms. Okay, let's go to Lake Erie. Uh, this is the reason why many of you have come to this uh, webinar. Uh, and I wanted to show you some data that we've um, been gathering with uh, folks from the uh, uh, Bowling Green State University uh, 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 Oceans and Human Health Center work that we've been doing on Lake Erie. Uh, first of all, again, microcystis dominates in the western part of the lake. Uh, plankton thrix can bloom locally here in uh, Sandusky Bay, for example. Uh, and what we have done is essentially taken a similar approach to looking at uh, what's controlling the blooms in uh, Erie. And when we do that work, same kind of bioassays, cubitainers, and you can see them uh, being incubated here off the uh, finger pier over here at the stone lab. Uh, we collect the water, then bring it over to the stone lab and assay it essentially in situ. Uh, and again, compare controls. Oops, let's go back here, compare controls to nitrogen additions, and we added nitrate and ammonium and urea individually, phosphate and N and P together. And you get a very similar picture that we get for Taihu. Uh, this is uh, Sandusky Bay data uh, showing that nitrate stimulates, ammonium stimulates urea, but phosphate not. And that's probably because there's a lot of internal cycling of phosphorus that's already in the system. Uh, actually, the Western Lake Erie picture is somewhat similar. But again, if you add N and P together, you get the most, very similar to the Titan situation. And if we impose a 40% dilution, and we pick that number because that's been 
recommended obviously for, um, um, for uh, Erie by the uh, US Canadian uh, agreement, uh, you see there is in fact good reduction of stimulation of the bloom by a 40% reduction for both N and P. So I think that's heading in the right direction, uh, but I, clearly we need to deal with N as well as P uh, to uh, meet these reductions. Okay, I'd like to uh, switch a little bit to lakes that are actually uh, manipulated, entire lakes that have manipulated, uh, because there has been some criticism of the bioassay techniques that, you know, they're in containers, there's no uh, connection between the sediments and the water column during the incubations, even though they're short term incubations. So, okay, let's see what happens in whole systems where these nutrients have been added. And this is work by, by uh, Wayne Wurzbaugh and others uh, that we've also uh, used in a publication back in 2016. Uh, and what you see, these are lakes, by the way, all the way from uh, Northern Europe, uh, Canada, um, mostly in the Northern. Um, uh, regions. If we add N, we get stimulation. If we add P, we get some, uh, but often not as much as N. But if you add N and P together, you get more than N or P alone. So again, this is arguing very strongly for this co-limitation. So the results then sort of point in a direction where it basically takes two to tango, so to speak. Uh, yes, N is important, P is important, but really uh, the availability of both nutrients is really what's key for the blooms. And uh, it's very unlikely that in many lakes where um, phosphorus uh, enrichment has occurred for many years that uh, you're only gonna solve the problem by reducing phosphorus uh, because it's of the strong internal uh, cycling. And so, you know, we need to go for nitrogen as well. Uh, this has been tested in many lakes, actually. If you, and then this is, uh, uh, data, not necessarily all on cyanobacteria dominated lakes, but uh, mostly cyanobacteria dominated lakes and other uh, water bodies. Uh, the results being that essentially um, N and P give you more than N alone or P alone. So this is not just a China or Lake Erie story. Uh, it appears to be uh, more of a global story. Okay, so let's switch from nutrients to uh, issues with climate change that we're facing. And everyone knows, of course, that it's getting warmer. If we look at the North Atlantic uh, anomaly, uh, things have been getting warmer over the past 150 years or so. Uh, that has led to more intense storms and more storms. These, these, this is the record of uh, Atlantic Basin storms, including uh, subtropical cyclones. And you can see that's increased. That, of course, has led to, uh, as we all know, um, tremendous uh, human uh, suffering and impacts, but also uh, more abrupt uh, uh, pulse inputs of, of uh, water with nutrients in systems. And the question then is, you know, how does that impact the blooms? Uh, and here we have two scenarios up here, the high flow one, and then followed by the uh, drier conditions. So you can imagine this being sort of a pre-summer or spring, high rainfall period in the uh, temperate area, but also maybe a tropical storm situation and that in, the, uh, in the subtropical areas, then followed by a drier situation. And what we see is that yes, the flushing rates are higher uh, with these inputs or with these high inflows, but when you reduce the uh, flushing rates uh, with dry, dry or drought conditions, of course the nutrients have been deposited in the system, and then you get the cyanobacteria taking over because they like the uh, long residence time conditions uh, as actually they're slower growers than uh, most uh, eukaryotic algae. So uh, when we look at that sort of in a sort of physiological situation, here's again the increase in temperature that we're seeing globally, or at least in the Northern Atlantic, uh, but there's also good data from lakes these are the epilimnia data from the Netherlands that have been published by Jeff Heisman and his group in the Netherlands. And they show that in the mixed layer of these lakes uh, since 1900, there has been an increase in temperature. Uh, Lake Erie is a little bit more challenging. 
uh, as you can see here, we, the data, of course, is not as, uh, doesn't go back as far. And there's a lot of interannual variability, but it does tend to sort of show an increase in temperature occurring as well. And then if we look at the uh, temperature versus growth rates for different uh, phytoplankton that are out there competing with each other, you see that the cyanobacteria uh, optimize their growth at the highest temperatures relative to say diatoms, uh, dinos, and chlorophytes. So there are two reasons then why uh, warming seems to benefit cyanobacteria. One is this uh, stronger warming and stronger stratification in the upper water column. And then of course, growth rates are accelerated at uh, higher temperatures. And that uh, isn't only true in laboratory experiments, there's actually data from uh, surveys that have been done. Uh, this is data from uh, Sarim Kostin and her group in the Netherlands. Great paper in global change biology showing that in 143 lakes uh, stretching from uh, Tierra del Fuego uh, all the way up to the Arctic Circle. Uh, if you look at temperature uh, versus TN and then look at the percent of biomass that's actually um, uh, in cyanobacteria, you can see that cyanos, they like it hot, but they also like high TN uh, in these uh, systems. So there's a link there. There's also a link with TP, but actually, it's not as strong as the link with TN, which is kind of interesting, uh, you know, considering the emphasis we've put on phosphorus over the many years. So there's data, there's lab data, and there's field data uh, showing that uh, increases in temperature and stratification uh, accompanying uh, these fl flushes of uh, nutrients coming into systems uh, enhance blooms. So going back to Erie, uh, Erie is the shallowest and the warmest of the Great Lakes, obviously. Uh, it's possible, and I think we're really testing this hypothesis now, that really what we're seeing in Erie is the combined effect of eutrophication and warming. And this may be linked then to, uh, you know, uh, the 60s and 70s when we had a serious water quality problem in Erie. Um, that was ultimately uh, linked to uh, excess phosphorus inputs and uh, phosphorus was uh, reduced from wastewater treatment plants and point sources. Uh, we thought we had solved the problem and then lo and behold, uh, 10, 15 years ago, it re-emerged. So it could be that there is a link to um, warming that's occurred over that time period, giving cyanos a, a jump up on the other phytoplankton, even with some nutrient reductions. Uh, and so, the blooms have increased in severity. Obviously, I think everyone in, in the Midwest knows this. Uh, and you can see that data here uh, summarized from uh, Rick Stumps uh, et al's paper. Uh, and the early start was probably a result of the rapid early warming of Lake Erie starting in the end of May. Um, if you look at the uh, bloom initiation that's occurring in Erie, it looks like the blooms are starting earlier and they're lasting longer. And that clearly is linked to uh, climate change, or at least warming. And because of that, Western Lake Erie has experienced a one to two day increase in growing days per year since uh, 2002. So there's you know, evidence that in fact, warming is leading to uh, earlier bloom formation, uh, or at least the uh, opportunities to form blooms earlier in the year and extending the growth days, the number of days that the bloom can grow uh, if we look at the uh, difference in time between uh, bloom on versus bloom off in the system. So what do we know about Erie and other lakes or other large lakes um, in this context is that changes in water temperature patterns are leading to longer bloom window. Essentially the, the window of opportunity is getting greater. Increased growth potential could lead to blooms intensifying earlier in the summer. Uh, and you know, that can change if you have a, a not, if you have a relatively cool spring, uh, you know, this is gonna uh, delay the onset of the bloom, obviously. So this is kind of a, a you know, a overall average kind of conclusion. And this leads to the increased risk, obviously, for managers and recreational uses, uh, because these cyanobacteria produce toxins uh, and therefore represent not only an environmental uh, threat, but a uh, human health threat that's being looked at now in many ways. 
Turns out that some of the toxins that are produced like microcystins can also be aerosolized. And so there may actually be an air quality issue in addition to a water quality issue. And that's being uh, looked at now. Uh, however, temperature is not the only factor driving the blooms uh, in the context of climate change. And we know that hydrology is changing tremendously. Storms are getting more intense, more extensive and more frequent. Uh, that means that loads of nutrients associated with these storms are increasing in sort of a pulse loading kind of scenario uh, that we're seeing globally. Uh, and uh, if those storms are followed by droughts or dry periods, then you have kind of the perfect storm scenario. You know, you've put the nutrients in with the pulse loading, and then they're essentially in the system cycling when you have the uh, drought, the following drought. In the Erie watershed, uh, clearly more rains lead to more nutrient inputs. So obviously there has to be an emphasis on um, adapting to this uh, change in climate um, by putting in all you know, buffers, things like that, uh, timely application of fertilizers, uh, et cetera, that I think uh, most folks are, are uh, aware of. And I think there'll be probably be more discussion about that uh, during the, the session here. I wanted to show you some other scenarios where more extreme events have also led to um, expansion of cyanobacterial blooms. And here in my backyard up here in um, the northern part of the Albemarle Pamlico Sound System in North Carolina, we have Albemarle Sound, which is a brackish system. It's primed for algal blooms uh, and they're increasing in response to more episodic uh, runoff events that are coming into this large system depositing the nutrients. And then once the nutrients are in there and it's followed by a dry period, essentially we're getting expansion of the blooms into the uh, sound. And this is an alarming trend considering that uh, Albemarle Sound is a uh, prime crab fishing area. Uh, and uh, of course the blooms are dominated by microcystis as well as uh, also Dolichospermum and uh, Cylindrospermopsis, all of them toxin production. Product producing uh, cyanos. Uh, North Carolina is not the only place facing this problem. Uh, and uh, gosh, just uh, given what's happened in, uh, in the Gulf over the last several weeks, uh, this slide is more than appropriate. This is uh, data from the Sybil Bargu that she uh, sent me on the increased freshwater pulses that are coming in from the Mississippi and also the Atchafalaya into the uh, coastal Gulf of Mexico. That's freshening up the system, but it's also bringing in more nutrients. And as a result, you're essentially expanding the domain of cyanobacteria into the coastal region here, which is fresh enough to support these blooms and obviously high enough in nutrients to do so. And the toxicity associated with these blooms uh, can be quite significant as well. If we go to Florida, um, also a hurricane prone area or tropical cyclone prone area, uh, we um, see the Lake Okeechobee uh, fiasco, so to speak, uh, as it's been termed by many uh, folks trying to deal with this issue. Uh, lake Okeechobee is the largest lake in the Southeast uh, and it's had a history of these cyanobacterial blooms as well uh, that are promoted by nutrient inputs from urbanization as well as agricultural inputs. And then if you uh, um, put a hurricane through this region or a, or a cyclone, uh, the lake has to be flushed because if it isn't, the dikes will break and you'll get major flooding. So the release of water has to be via the uh, um, um, forget the name of the system, the river now, um, uh, coming in from both um, the, uh, coming into the coastal Atlantic as well as going into the Gulf. And with that, of course, is transporting the bloom as well. So are you getting the bloom being transported out, uh, at the Caloosahatchee, that's it, uh, out to uh, the coastal embayments here on the Atlantic as well as uh, over here on the Gulf side, uh, the bloom's being transported, but the nutrients are also being transported. And there's freshening going on from all this fresh water that's being released into the uh, coastal system. So as a result, 
um, it's been very detrimental, obviously, to estuarine systems in Florida as well, because the blooms can last for some period of time. And then if they lice, of course, then the toxins will be released into the water as well. So even if the bloom goes away, the toxicity could still be uh, remaining in these uh, coastal uh, embayments and estuaries. Uh, back to North Carolina, to the uh, New River, which is a uh, semi-lagoonal uh, river. It's behind the barrier islands here. It's just uh, south of where we are here in Moorhead City. Uh, we've studied this place pretty intensively using vertical profilers uh, to look at water quality. And I just wanted to show you what happens uh, when we get a tropical cyclone moving through here uh, in, in um, 07. Uh, this is uh, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, and turbidity. And here's the uh, cyclone coming through. Uh, and you can see that as it does, it's mixing everything up and creating uniform conditions in, in temperature, uh, salinity, uh, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, uh, and you see a big peak in turbidity, which is resuspension of sediments from the uh, bottom. The thing I want you to focus in on here is the chlorophyll, because there was a bloom before the cyclone came through. Then the cyclone came through, mixed everything up, and then the bloom very rapidly uh, reestablished itself again. Uh, and what we think is going on here is that we're getting sediment resuspension in this high turbidity uh, situation, bringing more nutrients in from the sediments, but also runoff, of course, is containing some of the nutrients. And it doesn't take long for the cyanobacteria to uh, take advantage of that situation. And if we go back to Taihu, we have an analogous situation there because it's on the hurricane or the, uh, the uh, typhoon track, so to speak. Uh, and we've been there enough years to be there in years where there has been typhoons in August and years where there wasn't a typhoon. And what you can see is sort of a similar scenario. This is chlorophyll uh, from space um, detected by MODIS. And you can see here, here, and here, we've had typhoons in the summer in August. And then after the typhoons, the chlorophyll uh, increases, the blooms actually increased uh, tremendously. And we think the same thing is going on there. Sediment resuspension and uh, watershed nutrient pulses coming into the system. So, you know, the cyanos are uh, very adaptable as long as there is good enough weather after this event occurs uh, to sustain the bloom. That's really the key. Most of the typhoons in uh, this area occur in August, so there's plenty of good weather and warm conditions afterwards to reestablish the bloom. And here's the sort of ultimate manager nightmare in Taihu. You know, we're trying to reduce nutrients to uh, deal with uh, reducing the uh, bloom potential, but at the same time, wind speed is decreasing, and this is uh, good data over long periods of time. So that's enhancing uh, vertical stratification. Temperatures are increasing, particularly at night in the system. Uh, and rainfall is increasing in these pulses. So we have this additional challenge here of, uh, yes, we're reducing nutrients, but chlorophyll actually uh, has been going up. So uh, we may need to reduce the nutrients even more under this scenario uh, because of the, uh, the, the conditions that are being imposed uh, through climate change, making it more amenable for the blooms to form. So just to uh, summarize and um, uh, try to put this all together in one kind of uh, summary pick page, uh, the data indicates that, uh, you know, phosphorus is important, but nitrogen is important too. And I think you're going to hear more about that from Sylvia and Tim coming up. Uh, the bloom thresholds uh, vary in different systems. Uh, but in most cases, uh, the reductions that are going to be needed are going to be pretty significant. And they seem to go along with historic increases in nutrients that we see in these large lake systems. That's probably because there's a long legacy of storage of these nutrients over the years as well. Salinity is not a necessarily a, ba a barrier to this expansion. Uh, so, you know, we could be seeing more um, blooms occurring in coastal waters. 
and certainly in embayments and, uh, and in estuaries. And we may need to reduce NNP inputs even more in a warmer, stormier world because blooms like it hot. And these episodic extreme events favor cyano cyanobacteria, particularly if you have flooding followed by droughts during a signal growth season. And we need to impose these nutrient restrictions year round. Uh, most of these lakes have residence times longer than a year or uh, for sure six months. So just reducing phosphorus in the spring and nitrogen in the summer just uh, ain't gonna cut it. So I think we're really looking at long-term uh, strategies for reducing these nutrients. And then of course, warmer, longer growing seasons, earlier ice off and later ice on are also promoting the opportunity for these blooms to form. And uh, I'll stop there and just wanted to acknowledge, um, first of all, all my collaborators uh, that we've been working with. Uh, this is actually uh, off the uh, dock over here at the uh, University of Toledo's uh, station with Tom Bridgman collecting the water for a bioassay uh, that we did a few weeks ago. Uh, also, um, the uh, centers that have been involved in looking at these blooms and their human and environmental impacts. And we're part of the Great Lakes Center uh, that's centered at Bowling Green State University. And for any of those who are interested in uh, more detailed uh, results and overviews, please go to our website. There's lots of good stuff there. And please uh, feel free to email me, uh, particularly if there was something that wasn't clear that I presented in my talk. Thank you very much. Hans, thank you very much for that. Um... Can you hear me just so we make sure we're got a yeah, connection? Yeah, I can hear you. I can Good. hear you. So we had a couple questions submitted uh, when people registered, and then also some that came in on the chat. So I'm going to kind of send some of those your way. We will not have time, of course, to answer all these. Uh, no, of course. But I'll bring them to you. Uh, one, this one matches both questions submitted beforehand and during. Hans, you mentioned important increases in heavy participation events that bring more nutrients. These runoff events also increase DOM, dissolved organic matter, that alters nutrient availability in underwater light environment and increases the strength of thermal stratification. Do you have any insight on, on what these pulses of DOM are doing in this system in relationship to NNP and, and, and HABs? Yeah, well, it's, I'm glad that this question was raised because I think it's the subject of uh, current research efforts. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, DOM is a, uh, you know, one big pool, but we're also looking at DON, dissolved organic nitrogen, as part of that pool. And there's evidence, uh, more and more evidence uh, emerging. And I don't know, Sylvia might have something to say about that as well. That organic nitrogen may actually be another uh, important uh, driver of these blooms. Uh, and also, of course, the organic matter is going to play a role in enhancing nutrient cycling. Uh, so, um, you know, direct use is a possibility, and we know that cyanobacteria are capable of taking up organic compounds, but also this sort of altered the, the way in which the biogeochemical cycling in these systems is altered by more organic uh, matter inputs is likely to play an important role, particularly for uh, mobilization of nutrients from the sediments back up into the water column. Uh, so, yes, the answer is. It's important. Uh, and lastly, <clears throat> with regard to the color issue, um, you know, these compounds are, can be highly colored, particularly uh, where in North Carolina, for example, where we have a lot of black water systems. But the cyanobacteria can get around that uh, by altering their uh, position in the water column. So this may actually be an advantage to them as well that as the uh, eukaryotes have to deal with lower light in the uh, underlying water, the cyanobacteria do just fine under those conditions. Hans, thanks for that. We'll try to get one, maybe two more in here. Um, on a number of occasions in the past, we've observed that blooms were P limited in the spring and could become nitrogen limited in August or later. We have also observed that blooms are most toxic early in their formation when they had both N and P. Is this also what you're seeing? Yes, I think we're, we're seeing that in Taihu for sure. I think Tim Davis probably will have something to say about that as well. Um, you know, here's my interpretation of this, and you know, uh, it, may, it may conflict with others. Um, 
one of the reasons why we get that strong P limitation in the spring is that there's a lot of nitrogen coming off the watershed uh, from spring runoff, particularly after uh, post fertilization and intensive storm events. So that's leading to plenty of nitrogen being there in the spring. And then we see that in Taihu, we see that in Erie and other places. Uh, so there's not a shortage of nitrogen. And we know that these toxic compounds have a lot of nitrogen in them. I think microcystin itself is like 17% or so. So um, there's certainly not a shortage of nitrogen uh, 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 that could constrict, con you know, could uh, restrict the formation of these toxins. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know, we still don't know a whole lot about the function of these toxins, but there's not a shortage of nitrogen. So in the spring, often toxicity can be quite high because it's not limiting the, the, and the nutrients are not limiting. Um, my own hypothesis about this is that one reason why we see high toxicity in the spring in early phases of the bloom is that these toxins uh, can be linked to uh, high rates of photosynthesis. Uh, microcystins are very good at scavenging uh, reactive oxygen species. And we know that when oxygen is supersaturated in, in a bloom, for example, you do tend to get a lot of these reactive oxygen species. And the microcystin production may actually be a protective um, thing for the cyanos because early in the bloom, of course, they're going great guns photosynthesizing, and they may actually be creating a toxic situation for their own uh, immediate environment. And the last thing I'll mention about that is that these toxins, uh, particularly microcystin, are endotoxins. They stay in the cell. So whatever the mechanism is that is uh, uh, responsible for the formation of these toxins, it must have something to do with internal metabolism. And so that makes it pretty attractive that maybe it is linked to these uh, high rates of oxygen production and reactive oxygen species. And I'll stop there. Oz, thanks for that. We, we've run out of time here, but I will hit on one that came in. There was this tie when, with your reference to cyanobacteria being a dead end kind of in that trophic food, food web that stimulated some discussion via chat on, you know, there are some zooplankters that do eat the, the yeah. cyanos and that sort of thing. Of but then there was this discussion about why, why if we're having these cyanobacteria blooms and they're into the food chain, why are we seeing great fishery production? And I can weigh in on that a little bit in Lake Erie. Um, basically, we, we got to recognize that diatoms aren't the only food source for the fish that are in the lake. You're going to have I'm sorry, cyanobacteria. You're going to have diatoms in the spring. You're going to have green algae um, in the spring. Um, and so there's a lot of other things that drive fish production, good hatches, yeah. but also other sources of food outside of cyanobacteria. Well, so I, I, might that... just, I might just mention that not all cyanobacteria are bad actors. Uh, there's a lot of picoplanktonic cyanobacteria that are eaten by um, microzooplankton. So they may actually be an enhancing um, production at higher, you know, at higher levels. It's really the bad actors that are uh, causing the problems. Hans, thanks for that clarifying additional comments. That's great. Again, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the chat questions. I think I hit most of them. Um, so we're going to turn it back over to Jay to introduce the next speaker. And again, Hans, on, on behalf of all the attendees, thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. Great. Our next speaker this morning is Dr. Sylvia Newell, who is an associate professor at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. While many of us have been focused on phosphorus, as Hans notes, Sylvia has been leading work to understand the role of nitrogen plays in the formation and regulation of algal blooms and how this knowledge can be used to prevent these blooms. <clears throat> Currently, her work focuses on Lake Erie, Lake Okeechobee, and Lake Taihu. Um, in Ohio, her research focuses on the Great Miami River and several smaller lakes. So thanks to Sylvia for helping us understand the critical role that nitrogen plays in algal blooms. And thanks for her presentation, which is titled, Nitrogen as a Driver of Habs is N Availability, the Missing Key to Modeling Microcystins. Go ahead, Sylvia. All right, thank you so much for that nice introduction, Jay. I Hopefully I'm successfully sharing my screen in a way that looks normal to all of you. Can you see me okay? Sylvia, actually I'm seeing uh, elapsed time and, and things like that. So it's not exactly perfect. Okay. I don't see the presentation. That, that looks a little Does better. I, better? Still, I still see the time on the right third of your screen. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what to tell you. I think if you uh, hit the presentation right now, you might have it. How's that? I'm still seeing the time on the right quarter of the screen. All right, is that better? Um, I, I'm not seeing the presenter view right now. I'm still seeing your slide deck on the left-hand side. Just go to full screen, Sylvia. I'm in full screen. It looks like full screen to me. It's okay, we can see it. But you can see your, your slides on the left-hand side. You can hold the individual slide. Maybe X that out. I I don't know, to me, it just looks like the full screen. Well, we, we can see it, Sylvia, so you might just want to go ahead. It, All right. It'll, it'll be okay. Well, sorry about that. But yeah, today I am going to be talking to you about work we've been doing on nitrogen in uh, specifically Lake Erie. I would really like to highlight my uh, former PhD student, now Dr. Daniel Hoffman, who is now a postdoc at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. And this is work that he mostly did in collaboration with uh, me and Mark McCarthy as his advisors and uh, Tim Davis was on his committee and that our other co-authors, Justin Myers, Tom Johengen and Ashlyn Bodecker. So thank you all so much for having me here today. I'm super excited to talk about this work. Daniel did a really wonderful job and I'm excited to highlight the work that he's done. So just to reiterate some of the things that Han said, but bringing in a little bit to Lake Erie, we have had a hab problem in Lake Erie for a very long time, but back in the 60s and 70s, it was mostly dominated by nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. And now our biggest problem child in Lake Erie, although not the only one, is microcystis, which cannot fix nitrogen. And this is really, really important because in terms of nitrogen availability, what we're putting into the lake and the kind of nitrogen we're putting into the lake, we now have these very big blooms that are also often super toxic. And this is partly because if you are a nitrogen fixer and you rely on nitrogen as a source, a nitrogen gas as a source of nitrogen, that triple bond is really hard to break. But we, as land use um, shift stakeholders, have been putting a lot of much easier to use nitrogen into Lake Erie for the last few decades. And when you get easy to use nitrogen, it is really easy to turn it into toxin. So I love this Chris Gobler figure from the 2016 harmful algae so, issue that we did. So Sylvia, this is Chris, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Folks aren't seeing your slides advance. They are seeing basically uh, your first slide and then the slide deck to the left. So we're getting, um, we got to figure out a way to get a different presentation here. Um, Aaron's got the slides, she can do it. Yeah, uh, Aaron can do it, um, or I'm happy to. Sylvia, I think it's the, um, you'd have to switch your screens. Like we're seeing, or I think someone suggested clicking mirror show up at the top, but again, I think we can only see that. Yep, let's work on seeing, Aaron, can you get, uh, can you stop sharing for us, Sylvia? And we'll try and share from Aaron, um, yep. Aaron Monaco's deck here. Sorry about this, Sylvia. That's why we it worked love. yesterday when I did it with yeah. Aaron. I don't know what to tell you. It's okay. It's okay. But we like to have the presentations in advance because this always this always happens. We can share. Yeah. While we have that this pause here, um, because perhaps this question is good for you that came in during Hans's presentation, Sylvia. So. Um, additional to a chlorophyll A, you know, uh, nitrogen is important for that, but does, but does this impact toxicity in warmer lakes? And, and maybe you're going to get to that in your talk. Oh, absolutely. Here, but does that's nitrogen... basically what this whole talk is going to be about. Good. I don't get there, I promise. Look at that. Look at that. All right. It looks like we've got, uh, are you seeing the slides yeah. on your end, Sylvia? Looks great. Aaron, keep going. Next one. All right. So this nice figure from Chris Gobler, and it shows that all the different kinds of nitrogen that are available, most of them involve a lot of different 
um, enzymatic steps to break them down ultimately into ammonium, which is the easiest form of nitrogen to use. It's like handing someone a $100 bill versus a $1 bill, right? One's a lot easier to use. The other one, you got to break for it to be accepted anywhere. And the energy that it takes to do that is energy that no cell wants to spend unless they have to. But if there's a lot of really chemically reduced bioavailable nitrogen around, and you've got a you know high ratio of that to everything else, then you've got a lot of leftover nitrogen you can use to make various kinds of toxin. Next slide. So Justin, who's gonna talk in a couple speakers, did a really nice study a couple of years ago showing that ultimately any kind of nitrogen that you add can end up increasing concentrations of microcystin. And in a given microcystin molecule, there are 10 N's and no P. So there's a lot of, a lot of nitrogen involved and any excess nitrogen is what sort of ultimately drives that toxin production. And when you don't have enough reactive nitrogen around that can inhibit toxin production. Next slide. So also from that issue of harmful algae is this graphic that I think really tells the story very well. That when you've got high nitrogen and high phosphorus, you're gonna get a mixed assemblage of cyanobacteria possibly with elevated toxicity. If you control and reduce N but not P, you might end up with a large bloom of nitrogen fixing bacteria. If you control P but not N, you might end up with less biomass, a smaller bloom, but it could be super toxic. And personally, I don't think that's a great idea. Right, so there are lots of forms of nitrogen and anything that's got you know, a triple bond or an oxygen next to it is gonna be harder to use. Anything like ammonia or urea or various kinds of dissolved organic nitrogen, those are super easy to use. And cyanos, particularly microcystis, are all really good at using those uh, reduced forms of nitrogen and they can turn them easily into toxin if there's excess nitrogen around. Next slide. So unfortunately, and since the mid 1990s, um, here we had the Oklahoma City bombing. I'm not entirely sure worldwide what caused the shift, but we moved away from ammonium nitrate as fertilizer and shifted toward using anhydrous ammonia and urea or urea ammonium nitrate. All of these things are much less likely to wash away in rain through groundwater than just straight up nitrate. So it makes sense to add it because it's gonna stick around in your soil longer but it's also a really bioavailable form of nitrogen that can get washed off fields um, in, in runoff events. Next slide. And unfortunately, again, this really reduced form of nitrogen is very good for cyanobacteria, whereas something like that nitrate actually favors the diatom community that Chris was talking about before, which is also a really good basis of a food chain for fish. And so the more ammonium to nitrate you have, you can see in this graph here by uh, Mark McCarthy in 2009 from um, Okeechobee showing that the more reduced nitrogen you have compared to oxidized nitrogen, the more you're going to favor those cyanobacteria. Next slide. And so ammonium then is super easy to use. Diatoms are really good at using nitrate, but cyanos have a very strong affinity for ammonium, possibly a stronger affinity with a little help from their heterotrophic bacterial friends, but that's a different story. Next slide. So today I'm gonna to mostly focus on work that Daniel did as part of his PhD work. He went out with Noah Glirel in Western Lake Erie um, monthly for a few years. And hopefully his data give us some insight into why we haven't been able to um, model microsystems very well. Keep going. So in Lake Erie, as you know, right, we have these big blooms, keep going. And Daniel focused on sites that are going away from the Maumee River mouth, and most of the Maumee River watershed is ag. Keep going. And that means then that as that kind of agricultural fertilizer has shifted and we have more capos and more manure going in, we have less and less nitrate washing in through the river and more reduced nitrogen form. So this is a paper that I published with co-authors in 2019, looking at the Maumee River load and what it's made out of. And it's getting increasingly less nitrate and more killed all nitrogen, which is basically all the not oxidized nitrogen coming in from the river. You can see that as we go from the 70s and 80s and then to the 90s and then post 2000s, we get more and more bioavailable, super readily available nitrogen being delivered into the lake. 
next. However, when we try to just look at ammonium or that same kind of ammonium to nitrate ratio or nitrate or any kind of nitrogen and compare that to particulate microsystems in terms of the glural monitoring data, we don't see strong relationships and we're not really sure why, except that we know that the concentration measurements really do not represent what's bioavailable. Concentrations are a snapshot in time of what's dissolved in the water, but particularly in these harmful algal blooms, the turnover of nitrogen is very, very fast. And turnover is what represents availability. Keep going. So today I'm gonna to focus on next, really just this exchange then in this very complicated nitrogen cycle, really just focusing on the turnover of ammonium, this uptake of ammonium into cells that then get broken down and regenerated, recycled, remineralized, whatever you wanna call it. But it's this exchange between what's available in the water versus what's available in the cells and how fast that turnover happens. And that turnover speed may be what the key piece that we're missing here. Next. So we're talking about Uptake, we measure it as general community demand. So we add 15 nitrogen in and it can be taken up into any different kind of cell. Next. But it can also be turned over and regenerated and, you know, feed out, broken down, released. And so there's this internal resupply of nitrogen that we tend not to pay a lot of attention to. We focus on external supply because that's really easy to measure. It's much easier to monitor rivers and look at the concentrations of what's going into the lake than it is to look at internal load. And internal load turns out to be super important for supporting harmful algal blooms. Keep going. So Daniel went out, like I said, monthly with no gliral between 2015, 2016, and 2017. And 2015 was a really big bloom. That's when this picture was taken and it was definitely a pea soup year. Next. And he did these turnover rates then by adding 15 ammonium and looking at how much ended up in cells and how much got released. Next. And we do these in bottle incubations in both the light and dark to try to tease apart a little bit what's happening with the regular phytoplankton community, cyanobacteria versus heterotrophic bacteria that don't require light. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, they're just combined together. But basically we add 15 ammonium and then 24 hours later, we look at how much made it into cells versus how much new 14 ammonium got recycled around. And I'm happy to answer questions about that method at any point later. Next. So the four stations that Daniel focused on were in Western Lake Erie. You can see they move out away from the Maumee River mouth, although that top one, WE4, is more influenced by the Detroit River than the others, but they generally represent a gradient moving away from river mouths. Next. And so those stations are gonna be the same four stations on the bottom of all the graphs here. You can see them both um, for the light and dark on the left side, that's ammonium uptake rates. And then regeneration is on the left in, um, these are all in, gonna be in units of micromole per, of ammonium per liter per hour, uh, multiplied by 14 if you wanna get to grams per liter or micrograms per liter. But notice that this is in per liter per hour. And we're talking about, um, about 0.2 to you know, 0.1 micromole per liter per hour. That is a lot of nitrogen that's becoming available. Um, in any given moment in time, and you're not seeing it by looking at the dissolved concentration because it's constantly being created. And these are all um, cutoff points here because, I mean, these are all um, box and whisker plots, but there are some points that were cut off that don't even make it on the screen where it goes up to 12, 15, 20, 25 in the middle of a bloom. These like super high moments in time where you might have a really high resupply of nitrogen that is just, happening too quickly to measure in any given concentration. Next. And so if you look at that over time, then you can see that this is just uptake now. So this is demand. This is how much the cells want to take up ammonium. All the cells that are there, everyone's competing for ammonium and there's an extremely strong demand for it as you get into bloom season, you know, late June, July, August, September, there's a very high demand. And that resupply cannot meet the demand, but it can meet a lot of it, particularly at the beginning of the bloom. Keep going. So if you look at the regeneration now, you probably don't remember the y-axis, but trust me when I tell you it's about half. 
So particularly in June and July, that turnover rate is so great that it can almost meet the demand often of the cells that are there. There's a huge amount of nitrogen being turned over internally in the water column in Western Lake Erie. Next. And so this is then showing how much of that demand for nitrogen can be supported by that resupply. And you can see in June, it's 75 to you know 125% of that demand can be supported by turnover. In a high bloom year though, by the time you get down to August, it's uh, you know only about 40 to 50 percent in a, in a less high bloom year can be a little bit different. But in general, that internal resupply supports a significant, even at the peak of the bloom down to 25 percent of what they want, it's still available. It's still a new source of nitrogen that's being turned over all the time in the water column. Advance. And so if you compare that to how much nitrogen is coming in at those given months or uh, moments in time, this is actually from the week before the sampling date coming out of the Maumee River. This is the total nitrogen in metric tons that's being delivered. And what you can see is that um, in that July and August and even October period, there's very little coming out of the Maumee River. It's almost all being supported by that internal resupply just because there's not a lot of rain in those dry parts of the year. And so at peak bloom season in August, that's when that internal resupply is so important because it's, it's what's supporting most of the nitrogen availability for the bloom. Next. Next. So we've got 27 to 39,000 metric tons of nitrogen per year coming in through the Maumee River into the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Next. And then that internal resupply, if you calculate it out um, by monthly and then scale that up to the year, you can see that um, actually just during the summer, just during the months that we measured from April through October, that turnover can resupply in that time 60 to 76% of the annual load of nitrogen. And this is in a very short uh, residence time, right? It's only you know up to like 60 days in the Western Basin, but that water it gets turned over fast enough that that short um, residence time doesn't even really matter because it's turning over so quickly. Next. So then, modeling toxicity that goes with these blooms is really hard. So microcystins concentration is just, it's a hard thing to model and predict. And so Daniel used this regression approach that includes are the relevant environmental parameters that everyone models, but plus our turnover rates. And we're able to model microcystin pretty well with an R squared of 0.83, which is, in my opinion, pretty darn good for modeling microcystins. Next. And so if you break down what are the factors that are contributing to this model to try to represent microcystins the best, we see that um, about 50% of it is essentially biomass. So phycocyanin is an indicator of um, microcystis biomass. So about 50% of the model is derived on just how many cells there are. Makes total sense. And then you've also got concentrations of different kinds of nitrogen available. TIN is dissolved in organic nitrogen. TDN is total dissolved nitrogen. And then air temperature, I think is in here mostly as a seasonal bit, like it's gonna be hottest really in July and August. So that sort of represents the seasonality. But the rest of the model, next, is all, um, next, is all based on ammonium turnover. So that full third of that R squared is coming from ammonium turnover. So usually we only get like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, um, our squares when we're trying to model microcystins, it's not very good. And to me, I think what gets us to that good R squared is this ammonium turnover. I think this is the piece that we've been missing, trying to figure out how much nitrogen is actually available in the moment, as opposed to the snapshot concentrations that we're able to get from grab samples. Next. And so then you can turn around and try to model that turnover using just general parameters that everyone is monitoring. And unfortunately, these things are um, correlated with one another, one another. So part of modeling uptake is this regeneration. And that regeneration then, though, we can not model quite as well. R squared of 0.689 is still pretty decent, though. But we can use things like chlorophyll, PAR, conductivity, amount of nitrogen concentration, when in the bloom we are, air temperature, and the external load to get a pretty good idea 
of what the regeneration is going to be at any given moment in time. And if you had a pretty good regeneration value, you could put it into this model for uptake and get actually a very good R squared on modeling the uptake of a 0.82 R squared. And so we could try to create and plan to in the future, that's sort of our next research step here, is try to create these nested models of using things that everyone is measuring when they're doing monitoring, or at least in the case of TN load, only where Johnson and Heidelberg are measuring, but we all use because it's publicly available. And we could use all of those things together, those general parameters to try to model in a nested approach uh, microsystem concentration. So that's the goal of where we're trying to go next with this. Next. So in summary, regeneration or turnover of nitrogen in the water column. So internal load of nitrogen is really important. It helps sustain um, uh, non-fixing nitrogen blooms and during peak biomass, 20 to 60% of the demand. So that's a lot when you've got very low nitrogen concentrations and very low external loads. And then we think that those turnover rates, not the concentrations, are really the key to accurately modeling toxin concentrations. Next. So in take home, any models that we're developing or a nitrogen budget really has to take into account these internal loading processes. Next. So then I'd just really like to thank everyone in the lab who helped out with sampling. Um, Justin at Stone Lab, Arthur Zastepa at Environment Canada, and different people from, formerly from Glural anyway, Tom Johenshin and uh, Dwayne Gosso. So thank you all. I really appreciate your time and sorry about the uh, technical issues at the beginning. Sylvia, thanks for that talk. Can you hear me? Can hear you great. Good. So a couple that I'm going to pull from the previously submitted questions, but some did actually come in over the chat function. Um, and some of them might be out of your wheelhouse, but I'm going to ask them anyway. One came uh -huh. up uh, during Hans's talk that I didn't get a chance to get to, but we talk about temp, um, increased temperature, increasing uh, cyanobacteria growth. So, right, they like it hot is what Hans had told us. But the question that followed that was also how does temperature relate to toxicity. So is, is there any information or work that you've done that ties increased temperatures with toxicity? So I have not personally done any experiments that directly measure this. My understanding of what um, has been happening in the literature and particularly through work being done by Tim Davis and George Buller, John, Mike McKay, Steve Wilhelm, is that we see toxicity per cell and toxic strains dominate more at the beginning of a bloom when temperatures are lower, but it really has to do with nitrogen availability. There's just usually a lot more rain at that time, a lot more external load. And by the time we get to peak bloom, all, all the cells are carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus starved in terms of their genetic expression. Steve Wilhelm's group has showed that. And at that point, if you're starved for everything, you're not making toxin. So not only do we see toxins per cell go down, but non-toxic strains start to dominate and the temperatures are higher, but it's not a function of temperature. It's a function of how much biomass or cells you have competing for the same resources. And they're gonna be competing the highest at that highest part of the bloom, that hottest part, but it's not a direct function of temperature. Thanks for that, Sylvia. And I think you may have um, answered this or, um, but uh, I'm going to read it to you anyway. Given the recent report by Molot et al. Um, Molot, yeah. Yeah, the cyanobacteria blooms are promoted by low redox in which Lake Erie is used as an example. Are there plans to include a redefined biochemical view of HAB causation and forecast rather than uh, events simply caused by XSP? Well, given that what I just talked a lot about here today was essentially reduced nitrogen, um, I hope that that's true. I certainly hope that we are planning to include more, you know, give more shifts to reduce nitrogen going forward. I will see though that it is a harder thing to monitor from satellites. It's a harder thing to measure in general. And it's one of the reasons why we've been so excited about the possibility of being able to model the different nitrogen turnover parameters based on stuff that everyone has access to, anyone who's doing, you know, general monitoring, because it is hard to measure those turnover rates. It is hard to do you know, more specific reduced condition measurements. Thank you for that, Sylvia. Um, 
I'm trying to look uh, for others. I'm not really seeing any in this space. Some of it was answered via the chat dialogue that's happening in real time. Uh, oh, Laura, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the content here. Yeah, the TDK and Laura's that you mentioned. Clarifying the TKN did not increase. It's the TKN to nitrate um, increased, and that was due to a decrease in nitrate as opposed to a general increase in TKN. Uh, question is coming in. Uh, how can the um, NH4 turnover be more efficiently controlled? Do you have any suggestions on that? Ooh, buddy. That involves controlling heterotrophic bacteria, and that would be a very difficult thing to do. I'm not sure we can control how fast heterotrophs are going to do their thing. What we can control is how much they have to play with. So if you've got a lower you know, external TN load, you're going to have less to turn over. Thank you for that. And Sylvia, I just wanted to point out too, and, and please weigh in. Uh, clearly, you're talking about this internal load or this recycling regeneration of, of nitrogen, but all the work that we've seen come out shows that that in, at least in Lake Erie, not inland lakes, but at least in Lake Erie, there isn't a lot of phosphorus internal loading in here. This, the work that you're doing is specifically to nitrogen and not necessarily phosphorus. Actually, no. So when we talk about internal supply of phosphorus, so a lot of times what people mean is phosphorus coming out of the sediments. And there is phosphorus coming out of the sediments. Um, our master student, Ashlyn Bodecker, has a nice paper in um, JGLR in 2020 looking at internal supply of SRP from sediments. So that's not what I'm talking about. When we're talking about nitrogen being taken up and re-released, so anything that's happening as dissolved organic nitrogen, all organic nitrogen is going to be, well, not all, but almost all, is going to be hooked to carbon and possibly P. So when we're talking about turnover of organic material, we're talking about re-release of P as well. So there is an internal supply of P. There's just not a good way to measure it because it's much harder to do P stable isotope work. And I'm hoping Kevin McClooney, if he's here, will do this someday, but we haven't gotten there yet. It's very expensive and very difficult. Thanks, Sylvia, um, for those uh, the presentation and those answers to the questions. I'll turn it back to Jay to get us back into the next speaker. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, our next, next speaker is Justin Chaffin, who is the research coordinator for Stone Laboratory. There he collaborates with stakeholders to lead research on cyanobacterial blooms in Lake Erie. So many of you are, are aware that we've had a model for the severity and extent of Lake Erie algal blooms that we've been using and continuing to improve for almost two decades. However, what we lack is a model to predict the toxicity of Lake Erie algal blooms. And Justin and his collaborators are leading novel work to develop just such a predictive tool. So thanks to Justin for this research that will better protect the public health of Lake Erie residents and those beyond Lake Erie and for his presentation today, which is titled Microsystems in Lake Erie, working towards developing a toxin concentration forecast. Take it away, Justin. All right, thank you, Jay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. And you see my screen? I can see your screen. It's not in presenter mode right now. Is it now? No, it is. It looks perfect. Okay, great. So I, I want to initially thank, there was a, a question for Hans that kind of stole my, the punchline of my, um, of, of my work here, but um, I'll, I'll give it in much more detail. And Sylvia talked on a model using in-lake parameters. Uh, we've uh, took a different approach to developing a toxin forecast. Um, so just a brief, quick outline. I'm gonna talk about what are microcystins. Um, there was lots of uh, discussion early on. Um, we're gonna talk about the relationship between microcystins and biomass. Um, we're gonna look at some of the triggers of microcystins. Um, and we're gonna talk about making maps microsystem. So we can see maps of blue-green algae in Lake Erie, but what about for microcystins? And then finally, some forecasts and some challenges to develop microcystin forecasts. So um, as we already know, microcystins are a group of toxins that are produced by cyanobacteria. Uh, microcystins target the liver. Um, those with unhealthy livers are more susceptible to the toxins. And what's important that hasn't been stated that microcystins can only be measured with water samples. So microcystins cannot be measured from satellites. You need, you need a, a sample on hand. 
there are over 200 congeners or 200 forms of microcystins, uh, but their structure and function are somewhat similar. And um, the different congeners have different toxicities. And a lot of this is um, overlooked in literature and in presentations. Um, microcystin LR is a very toxic form, which we find in Lake Erie. We also find microcystis RR in Lake Erie. Um, that is, has a lower toxicity. Uh, so both of these, to both these congeners are found on Lake Erie, uh, but they differ in their toxicity. So when we talk about microcystins, um, if you're talking about them in general, you're not talking about toxicity. We're really talking about microcystin concentration, which is different from toxicity due to these congeners. There are several types of cyanobacteria that produce microcystins. In the Western Basin, we have microcystis. In Sandusky Bay and some of the larger rivers, and make a laser pointer, uh, we have Planktothrix in Sandusky Bay. Uh, and we also have Anabena or Dilucospermum in inland lakes. Um, all these are common microcystin producers. Uh, however, we do not tend to find uh, microcystin with Dilucospermum in Lake Erie. Uh, so, microcystis in the main lake and Planktothrix in uh, the bays and rivers. So, is there a relationship between bloom biomass and microcystin concentration? So, can you just look at how green the water is, and then can you assume there's microcystins, and then should you put up a do not use uh, sign if you simply see green, or vice versa? If, is the water clear? Uh, do you not need it? So, is there a relationship between the two? Uh, this is some data we collected in the Western Basin uh, for several years. Uh, the x-axis is cyanobacteria biomass as, as chlorophyll A. And on the y-axis is total microcystins with the ELISA method. And we see that there's not a direct relationship between the two. And especially if we zoom in to where most of the data lies, we see that microcystin concentration cannot be predicted from cyanobacterial biomass. So if we're trying to develop a forecast, we cannot simply rely on cyanobacteria biomass. So as I said earlier, cyanobacteria biomass does not equal microcystin concentration, but concentration does not equal toxicity due to the different congeners. Um, again, when we're talking about microcystins, we're often talking about the total microcystins, not necessarily uh, what form is out there. We just assume it's all toxic when you uh, um, hear microcystin concentration. So why is there no relationship between biomass and microcystin concentration? Uh, there's several factors that go into this. Um, within microcystis cells, there are, or within the microcystis community, there are toxic strands and non-toxic non-toxic strain. So there are cells that can make the toxin and cells that cannot. Um, 10 genes are needed to make microcystins. And if you lack one, one or more of those genes, uh, the cells cannot make microcystins. And only genetic methods can uh, tell different strains apart. And additionally, toxic strains can alter the amount of microcystins per cell. So for example, this cell has lots of microcystins. Um, medium, low microcystins, and non-toxic cells. Um, so we, we, like to under, uh, we want to understand uh, microcystins to biomass ratio uh, to help us um, develop, uh, develop uh, toxin forecasts. Uh, when we look at the microcystin to biomass ratio, we see that often declines with nitrate concentration. Um, this is this figure here shows nitrate concentration as the black line. And then the red triangles are the ratio of microcystins to cyanobacteria biomass. And we see that decrease throughout the year. And this is just specifically for 2016, but we see this uh, nearly every year. As nitrate concentrations decrease, so do uh, the ratio of biomass, um, sorry, to microcystins to biomass. Also, we see a shift from toxic strains to non-toxic strains. So early bloom, uh, 
70 to 80 percent of the microcystins microcystis cells out there can produce toxin and as summer progresses into fall uh, we get 10 percent or less of microcystis can produce a microcystins um, uh, toxic strains need more light and they need more nutrients, mainly, uh, mainly nitrogen, uh, than non-toxic strains. And Hans mentioned um, a little bit about the effect of light, um, but toxic strains uh, need more light. Uh, er, so early bloom, there's more microcystins per cell than late bloom. Um, there's higher nitrogen, the water tends to be clear, so we get more toxic strains and we get more um, microcystins per biomass. We also see um, very similar things with the experiments. Hans talked about bioassays. Uh, when you add nitrogen, you increase microcystin, but only when there's enough light available. And that's what these white bars show. So at high light levels, adding nitrogen, ammonia, nitrate, or urea stimulates microcystin production. Um, saw in 2015 and 2016. So there's an interaction between nitrogen and light. So they need both high light and nitrogen for to make microcystins. Um, so to, you know, one of my goals to this was to make, um, produce maps of uh, microcystins, but we can make maps of cyanobacteria biomass uh, with, uh, remote sensing. For example, this is a slide, slide from Rick Stump showing the snapshots from 2002 through 2017. Okay, but we ask, you know, can we make similar maps for microcystins? And we need water samples to make those maps to measure microcystins. So we did a, um, what we called a HABS grab, which was a intensive one day survey of microcystin concentrations in the Western Basin. Many groups were involved in the HABS grab. Uh, there was eight, eight or nine different boats from different organizations, US and Canadian. And we all sampled different zones of the lake. All samples were collected with the same method. All samples were analyzed with the same method. And um, uh, all, only one lab measured microcystin, so we didn't have to worry about lab to lab comparison. And we also collected up uh, uh, all these samples here, uh, the red dots, uh, we analyzed for a total of 57 parameters, uh, including total microcystins with the ELISA method, but also with um, mass spectrometry. The background here, uh, this heat map, is uh, the, the cyanobacteria biomass measured from satellite. We also did a smaller HABs grab in 2018, um, only on the US side. Uh, the 2018 bloom was, was much smaller than the 2019 bloom. So this sampling was, was really grab and go. Uh, there was no anchoring, no onboard filtering. Uh, we collected um, the top two meters of the water sample, or top two meters of uh, the water column. Um, all samples were collected between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. We collected 100 samples in 2018 and 172 in 2019. All samples went to uh, the University of Toledo Lake Erie Center on the US side and the University of Windsor on the Canadian side. So this is a really large effort. Um, many boats on the water, lots of technicians on the boats, and then the, the lab crews waiting back at the lab uh, for, for processing and for filtering and for pouring out different aliquots. So here's the maps of microcystins during the early August. Um, 2018, I believe it was August 7th. In 2019, it was August 9th. So, you know, basically the same day. Uh, what we see here, we see that in 2018, uh, much lower concentrations than 2019. Uh, we see higher concentrations along the Ohio shoreline and up around the Bass Islands, whereas 2019 highest concentrations in Maumee Bay, but high concentrations along the Michigan shoreline, along the Ohio shoreline, and low concentrations near the island. And there's also um, uh, 
what in the paper we called a, a finger of biomass or a finger of toxins coming up towards Canada. So within these, you know, the toxins are not in the same location year to year. And if we look at 2019 closer, we see that microcystin concentrations varied by over two orders of magnitude over these short distances. So up close to the Michigan coast, you know, we have um, uh, concentrations up to 10, dry, uh, dropping quickly down to below detection. And in Maumee Bay, we have a concentration up to 50, you know, dropping down really quick. Uh, so these boundary, uh, these boundary layers of toxins and these rapid gradients are challenging for models to capture. Uh, earlier, I talked about the microcystin to chlorophyll ratio or the microcystin to biomass ratio. We see that was not spatially consistent. Um, there is as much variation in microcystin to chlorophyll uh, spatially as there was temporally. So not only will this ratio change over time, but it will also um, vary throughout the lake. Um, in 2018, the highest ratio of toxins to biomass was uh, near the Oak Harbor area and out by the islands. Whereas in 2019 in Maumee Bay and along the Ohio shoreline had higher ratios of toxin to biomass. Uh, in the center of the bloom, very low toxin to biomass. And if we plot that microcystin to biomass ratio against nitrogen, we see that there was less chlorophyll or less microcystins per chlorophyll at low nitrogen concentrations. Um, so when there's less than 20 micromole of nitrogen, uh, less microcystins per chlorophyll. And we did not see a similar relationship between phosphorus concentrations, the end of P ratio, or any of the physical water parameters that we measured. So the, the next question is, can we use historical data to, to map microcystins in previous blooms? Fortunately, there's lots of microcystin data uh, water plants are collecting samples uh, at least weekly. Many researchers are collecting water samples monthly to weekly, and the charter boat captains collect samples for us uh, weekly. However, once we got into that data set, we see that there's challenges. Um, you know, when there's 16 samples collected, you know, maybe we can get a good picture of microcystins, but we still don't know what's happening from, for example, this point and this point, if we're looking at microcystin data alone, and it becomes even more difficult or impossible when there's only two samples collected. So to overcome that, what we did is crunched all microcystin data uh, collected within a week, within seven days into one day. Uh, here's a map of that, so reds being high. And then we trace the outline of the biomass um, from satellite. So August, uh, August 14, 2017, here's the map of microcystins. However, when we compare that to the biomass data, we see that the two maps do not align. Um, high concentrations in Maumee Bay here and here, but we're missing uh, the rest of the bloom. Another example, uh, August 27th, High concentration of the microcyst in Mommy Bay, but yet we're missing uh, we're missing this part of the bloom. However, when we look at the Habs grab data set, we do see that the spatial pattern of microcystins and that of the bloom align. So for biomass, we see this um, uh, more or less this circle here, and we see it in the microcystin data. We see clear water east of the bloom. Again, no microcystins east of the bloom. So the spatial pattern matches when we have lots of data. So what this tells us that the routine monitoring for microcystin does not have the spatial resolution needed to inform models on a basin-wide scale. Now, during the Habs grab, we collected 172 data points. Um, however, routine monitoring, when you're getting less than 20 samples, uh, it's not enough. And the reason why they're not aligned because there's no microcystin data or microcystin samples collected or there were none collected in this part of the lake at that time. So some challenges to forecasting microcystin concentrations 
uh, are the low amounts of data to initialize models. And then once you initialize the model and run the models, you're not comparing, uh, you don't have a good data set to compare your output. Uh, the bloom boundary layer and a rap rapid concentration gradient in the bloom are difficult for models to capture. Um, there's no direct relationship between microcystin and biomass. And that biomass, a microcystin biomass ratio is not consistent spatially. So how do we build a, a microcystin forecast? Well, everyone's seen this forecast, uh, the bloom biomass forecast that takes Maumee River phosphorus load and we uh, estimate the bloom biomass. However, um, there is no relationship between phosphorus load and microcystins in the lake or nitrogen load and microcystins in the lake. So one option uh, that NOAA researchers recently did is uh, they asked, based on the chlorophyll concentration, what is the probability of microcystins exceeding a certain, certain threshold? Okay. Uh, so they use satellite data and updated uh, the models or their, um, their data analysis weekly with measured microcystin to biomass ratios. And then you can ask, you know, for a given chlorophyll, what is the probability that microcystins will exceed, for example, 0.3 or 1 or 5? Uh, my group wanted to take a slightly different approach uh, where we wanted to use those microcystin maps and then plug them into water current models, such as uh, the FVCOM model. So if you know where microcystins are today, you plug them into a, constant, uh, a current model, um, that should give you a possible forecast several days out. And then you can compare your modeled results to your, the observer results for the, the next week. Um, however, this was our initial ideal idea, but due to uh, the lack of data, uh, uh, how we start the models and how we compare the models is, um, is challenging. So we then confined our results to a, our efforts to a smaller area. We also wanted to incorporate microcystin production rates into these models. So not only do we just want to move microcystins around the lake as if they're in our particle, we want to uh, include production rates and degradation rates. Uh, we quantified microcystin production rates uh, using the bioassay approach. Uh, we did this for two sites um, during 2018 and 2019, and we did this every two weeks throughout the bloom year. Uh, monitor microcystin concentrations over time uh, with phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, we weren't necessarily concerned about which nutrient was limiting. Uh, we just wanted to maximize production and then have a control. So if we take that production rates and plug them into those current uh, micro, uh, water mass movement models, and then we simply ask, uh, would microcystin increase or, or decrease over a one week um, time span? Um, these graphs here are, are kind of complicated. Um, on the top figure is with microcystin production in the models. And then the bottom figure is without microcystin production. The different columns are different dates for 2018 and 2019. And then on the uh, the y-axis are uh, NOAA sites. When we see blue and dark blue, these means that the models were, were correct, that uh, microcystins increased in the models and they also increased uh, in the data set. Grays and light grays are incorrect, either um, microcystins increased or they decreased um, and it didn't match what was happening in the lake. But we can clearly see that when we included microcystin production in the models, the model was much more correct than without microcystin production. Uh, we also see that, um, uh, we also saw similar results if we asked, uh, what about uh, increase uh, microcystins over a certain concentration threshold? Uh, we also had better results in 2019 than 2018. Uh, 2019 was a much larger bloom, much higher concentrations of microcystins. You know, that you can draw a similar comparison um, to what to weather forecast. Uh, when there's a big, strong rain heading your way, it's pretty easy to tell that it's going to rain soon. So when you have a really large bloom happening, it's pretty easy to tell if, if the biomass or the microcystins are going to increase or not based on um, the size of the bloom or the size of the storm heading your way. We also had a uh, 
uh, better results early bloom than late bloom. And we also have uh, uh, different areas of the lake were better uh, at, at being forecasted. So uh, quickly to summarize, um, some suggestions to improve microsystem forecasting capabilities. So with the absence of microsystem data between two locations, uh, using the microsystem to biomass ratio of nearby locations or nearby samples, and then satellite biomass data is likely the best current method to estimate microsystem concentrations at an unmonitored uh, location. Uh, currently forecasting, so forecasting is looking into the future, not just um, hindcast, but forecasting the probability that microsystems will increase or microsystems will, um, uh, 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 the uh, forecasting the probability of microsystems increasing in concentration um, is probably most feasible. And one week out is probably the max we can do with the available data. Uh, we also need more microsystem data, especially further away from Maumee Bay. Uh, we need more surveys like the Hebs Grab, an uh, early bloom, peak bloom, and, and late bloom stages. Uh, we also need to understand biology of microcystis better. Uh, we need to uh, get more measurements of microcystin production rates and knowledge what regulates microcystin production. You know, uh, we had uh, only two sites in the Western Basin with coarse temporal resolution and that limited data set uh, provided initial promising results. And also we need to know the role of water clarity better. Uh, so it's not just phosphorus and it's just not nitrogen for microsystems. Uh, toxic strains have a higher light requirement. And I'll just give an example that the 2015 bloom was very massive in biomass, but had low microsystem concentrations. The lake had extremely high levels of phosphorus and nitrogen, but the lake was also very turbid from uh, uh, several large storms that came through and non-toxic strains dominated. So the role of light is is also important. Uh, so with that, you know, I'd just like to thank uh, the NOAA EcoHab program for funding our work, uh, the Ocean and Human Health Center that uh, funds Hans. Um, we're also uh, included in that, and several state um, agencies, Ohio Sea Grant, the Water Resource Center, Ohio EPA, and Department of Higher Education in the, the HABRI uh, program. Uh, so with that, if there's time, I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Justin, thank, Justin, thanks for that. There are a couple that come in, but I, I think that uh, these might be beneficial for both you and Sylvia to weigh in. So I'm gonna read them off and Justin, if you take first cut and then Sylvia, if, if, if you're still available, weigh in. And Sylvia answered one of these, but I don't know if how many folks are ch checking the chat function, but um, are the data um, about toxicity being peak in the early season and then decreasing through fall, is that a Lake Erie specific um, occurrence, or does that happen in inland lakes? And Sylvia took a first cut at it via the chat, but can you talk about um, this increased toxicity early and then a decline through the season? And is it yeah. ubiquitous? Yeah, we, we see that in many lakes. Um, when the lakes run out of nitrogen, uh, we get that shift. Um, so it, it happens, it happens all over. So it's just not a Lake Erie thing. Um, you, you know, microcystis, is going to be microcystis if it's in Lake Erie or any other lake. Um, so yeah, that it, it happens all over. Thanks, Justin. And I think Hans is on now too also, but Sylvia, uh, micronutrients metals are required as cofactor in the enzymes used in nutrient cycling could potentially limit regeneration. However, my metal bioavailability was very complex and limiting metal input to a system would be challenging. So does anyone who want to speak about metals and the impacts on toxicity and that regeneration? Justin, I know you've done some metal work with toxicity. Um, can you then follow that up, Sylvia, with regeneration? Uh, I, I guess I don't, I didn't quite understand it, but uh, e, e, you know, we, we know that if, if there's nitrogen available, it's going to be used. And uh, the amount of metals that are in the sediments aren't changing year to year, I would, I would think. Um, so I, I, you know, the main focus is just looking at what's coming down the rivers. Uh, I don't think we need to pay attention to the metals. Three. 
Hans is nodding his head. Sylvia, any thoughts on net metals and the regeneration of well, nitrogen in the system? I mean, I agree with Justin and Hans. There's a huge amount of metals. They're not all available, but they are coming in large quantities down the Maumee River. We've done some measurements of that. But in terms of regeneration, the graphs that I showed you were the actual rates. So even if they are constrained at some point by enzyme metal center availability, they're still doing it pretty darn fast. I think Hans wants to comment too. Please, Hans. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to I just wanted to point out that Justin's findings of higher microcystin production at high light levels um, actually supports the hypothesis that uh, high rates of photosynthesis may in fact uh, be one of the key things that control the production of microcystin because um, well, you know, one of the things we need to do is we need to understand why the cyanobacteria are producing microcystins in the first place. And we know it's an intracellular phenomenon, okay? You only see microcystins outside of the cell when they die and, you know, under those conditions. So it has to have something to do with the physiology of the microcystin itself. So high light promotes photosynthesis, high nitrogen promotes photosynthesis, and that typically occurs early in the year when the bloom first starts up. And so, you know, it does, um, and I might add that in, in addition to Justin's comment, we see this high microcystin phenomena in Chinese lakes early in the year as well. So I think it does support a uh, hypothesis that may be linked to protecting the, uh, you know, the cellular mechanisms of the cyanobacteria when there's enough nitrogen around to do so. And that's, and you know, so what's damaging? Okay, one thing that's really damaging is the production of oxygen, high oxygen production. It seems kind of paradoxical because they're producing the oxygen, but if they're producing super saturated oxygen in a, in a big bloom, that's when you get these high, these reactive oxygen species. And they're very damaging to cell physiology. So, you know, the combination of high light, high nitrogen, early in the year when the blooms are very active, uh, fits that hypothesis that they would be producing uh, compounds that might try to neutralize these reactive oxygen species. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Hans. Uh, we want to try and stay on time here. We're a little over, so I'm going to move on to the next one and have Jay come on and introduce uh, Tim Davis, our last speaker. Thanks, Justin, Sylvia, Hans, for those talks, and, and we'll come to you now, Jay. Thanks, Justin. Uh, I did want to point out that we are going to end up finishing a little bit past our um, early time end of <clears throat> 11.35. Uh, we do want to take some questions, so thanks for sticking with us a little bit past that 11.35 end. Uh, we should still be able to give you 45 minutes or so for a Zoom break and lunch break. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce our final speaker, Dr. Tim Davis, who is an Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at Bowling Green State University. His research focuses on plankton ecology with an emphasis on cyanobacteria, harmful algal blooms. Um, Tim is developing and implementing sensors capable of remotely detecting algal toxins at super low levels. Um, this near real-time data analysis and transmission protects human and animal health by allowing water managers to make important decisions quickly. The importance of this work was highlighted in 2019 in Washington, DC, where Tim received the Gears and Government President's Award for significantly advancing rapid and remote detection of harmful algal bloom toxins. So we thanked him for this research and his presentation today, which is titled, We Can't Do It Alone, Linking New Technology and Stakeholder Engaged Science to Monitor Harmful Algal Bloom Toxins in Western Lake Erie. Thanks, Tim, take it away. All right, thank you, Jay. Um, and, and again, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak today. So hopefully, um, I can share my screen and then okay. How are we looking, uh, oh. Tim? I can hear you fine, but I'm not seeing the presentation view. I'm seeing your um, slides on the left hand side. I'm going to switch the screen you're sharing on Zoom. 
Okay, uh, now I see your next slide on the right hand side. Okay, hang on. Sorry, we're having a little technical issues. Here. There you go. And that looks great. That's perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, great. Um, okay, we're good to go then. You can hear me and you can see my slides. Yeah, please proceed. Okay, perfect. All right. I hopefully will be able to, uh, to cut my uh, talk down a little bit, maybe to kind of catch us back up on time a bit. Um, but again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the, the really collaborative research that we're doing to kind of develop uh, newer technologies that will make it easier to um, rapidly test uh, for uh, cyanotoxin. So before I get started, you know, I just wanted to, uh, again, highlight and, and acknowledge the co-authors I've put up as well as uh, numerous um, uh, colleagues who have helped with this uh, work, uh, who I'll acknowledge at the end of the talk but also especially my former uh, master's student, uh, Seth Buchholz, um, who is now uh, with Ohio EPA, um, just started there a couple weeks ago. Um, he really was a, a driving factor in uh, coordinating all this work. So thank you, Seth. Okay, so we've heard a lot uh, from previous speakers about microcystis, uh, microcystins, but this uh, talk is not necessarily gonna be about nitrogen and, and uh, toxin uh, concentrations and toxin formation or community um, composition as, as Hans alluded. But I did wanna say that, um, well, my slide won't, there we go. That blooms are more than microcystis and microcystins. And I think that's very important to note, especially with the broad audience we have here today. Um, we have what what I call the 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 four you know the the big four big cyanotoxins right the four main cyanotoxins that we're that we're really concerned about so the hepatotoxins and liver toxins you have microcystins which we've heard a lot about this morning as well as salinity from opsins. and then for the neurotoxins we have anatoxin A and saxotoxins and I know Steve is on the line um, Steve Wilhelm and he always likes to say. You know, we really need to get back to calling microcystins fast death factor um, and, and anatoxin A very fast death factor. I think, you know, maybe we would get a little bit more uh, attention uh, using those terms. But regardless, these are, these are potent toxins. And what we are seeing is that we are often uh, seeing multiple toxins in a bloom, right? So rare, you know, oftentimes we're focused on microcystins because it's the most ubiquitous cytotoxin but that doesn't necessarily preclude other toxins from being produced. So what I'm gonna talk about today um, is a rapid field portable, easy to use um, toxin, quantitative toxin detection technology uh, that we've been working with um, with, uh, with our partners, uh, Light Deck Diagnostics and, and others that will hopefully help in, in filling some of those gaps uh, in, in toxin uh, concentrations and, and toxin monitoring that Justin was talking about in his previous, in, uh, just before I got on the, I got on the line. So hey, Tim, this is Chris. Uh, when you, yeah. when you were stuck on that first slide, now you've put it back to the presentation mode. It looks fine, but you're giving a, a preview of your next slide oh. and the way we're viewing it now. I don't want to give anything away. How about that? Hang on a second. Usually there's a slight delay. That's the one we want, man. That's the one that I want too. Okay. Um, aiming to please, Chris. So, all right. Anyway, so moving on, I, I'm not going to go into this uh, slide too much because Justin did a great job and I knew we were going to overlap, but I, I wanted to start off with this by, again, just pointing out that, you know, the Habs grab in 2018 and 2019, as Justin mentioned, were major efforts. Right? They collected a lot of very important uh, critical data, but they were major efforts. And what they showed is that toxin concentrations don't always align with bloom biomass. Right, So that was an important take home point from Justin's presentation. Um, but also that they vary across the basin. They can vary in very uh, short distances relative when you think about the overall size of, of Western Lake Erie. Um, Hopefully everyone can see my, uh, I don't want to annotate anything. 
Okay, sorry, hopefully everyone can see my cursor, but um, the top figure here is the bloom uh, biomass, and the bottom figure is the um, is the uh, forecast, or, the, or not the forecast, but the um, model um, toxin concentrations. And what you can see is from Maumee Bay here in the lower uh, left-hand corner um, heading out, toxin concentrations can vary significantly. All right, so that's important to know. Um, one, because, you know, just grab samples alone, wherever your station is, you know, in a very short distance, you know, the toxin concentration can vary. So uh, if you're sampling, you know, at, at station A or station B within a very short distance, the data that you collect and the numbers that you generate can be very different, which can impact your, uh, your, your seasonal kind of composition, your seasonal trends of what you're seeing. Okay, so that's very important. Also, as we collect these data, remember, these data um, had to come back to a lab and get processed. So when you, when you think about that, um, the current um, method for routine monitoring of cyanotoxins, especially microcystin, um, is the Abraxas benchtop you know, ELISA test. And it's, it's not bad, it's, it's EPA validated, um, it's, a, it's a good test, um, but it only measures a single toxin at a time, and it's a laboratory-based process. So all of the samples that we collect when we're out on the boat have to come back to a lab where they get processed, and usually they get put in a freezer. I know there are various methods and, and different uh, protocols for you know, water treatment plant managers, et cetera, uh, but if you're just collecting routine data, you usually collect the data and analyze it at the end of the year which is great when you're just trying to understand seasonal trends, but it's not so great when you're trying to make rapid management decisions. But even if you are, these tests can take anywhere between eight and 24 hours you know, or longer uh, to produce results. So most labs wait until there's a full plate prior to analyzing, mainly because they're just trying to cut down on costs um, as well as not having to create uh, you know, standard curves every time they're running a plate. Um, and also there's multiple steps. So even though you know, this, this kit is pretty um, uh, easy um, when it comes to the steps, there are multiple steps. So there's a lot more room for error, right? So what we need is we need a better method of being able to rapidly detect and quantify cyanotoxins and not just one, but multiple cyanotoxins. And this is where um, a newer technology uh, the company used to be MBio. They're now LightDeck Diagnostics. Um, they uh, have developed a portable, rapid cartridge-based system. And what we're doing through a NOAA MERHAB funder project is trying to connect stakeholders, academics, industry, and new technology. And you can see all of the uh, academic partners here, as well as our, our industry partner. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to take this emerging technology and get it into the hands of stakeholders to see, one, is it easy to use? Um, is it accurate? And you know, what are the limitations, right? Because no technology is perfect. So how do we find the limitations and try to deal with those limitations? So when you think about sampling for toxins, as Justin you know, made a great point in his, in his presentation, you know, getting out on the lake and collecting samples is difficult. And of course, we can't do a Habs grab every week. It's just logistically not possible. So what we need to do is we need to bring in citizen science and other partners who want to be part of the solution. They want to help collect data. They're out on the lake every day. Um, Justin has been working with charter boat captains since 2013 to collect samples and, and bring those samples back and analyze those using, you know, the, the laboratory ELISA test that I mentioned earlier. Um, but what I want to go through with you is kind of the theoretical process for being able to use this light deck uh, mini uh, multiplex uh, quantitative toxin detection technology. So the idea is if you see a bloom or if a water manager sees a bloom, they can collect a sample, they can extract the sample on site. Um, this is an MQ algae lice, it's not commercially available yet. But we're using it for this project. They can then take that extract and uh, mix it with uh, some, of, some reagents. So it's a one-step reagent mix and then add that mix to the cartridge here, which this floating hand is hanging on to. They insert it into the reader. And what this will do is it will analyze for microcystins and cylindrospermopsins. So it's a duplex assay at the moment. Um, 
in the same cartridge. So then what it will do is it will generate a report. And once it generates that report, we're working with uh, Limnotech, our colleagues at Limnotech to develop a, a database that uh, eventually our citizen scientists can upload their data to, right? So within about 30 minutes, we're able to go from whole water to results. And the question we often get asked is, well, how much do these, uh, do these readers and these, cart these cartridges cost? Well, the readers are about $7,000 and each individual cartridge costs about $25, which is about the same as a, a well and an Eliza plate. Uh, so uh, relatively inexpensive um, and easy to use, which so the startup costs are low and it's easy to use. So when it comes to the MERHAB project, what we did is we um, got 15 of these units. And, and when I say we, what I really mean is Seth. So we got 15 of these units and what we wanted to do before we just sent them out in the field and had people start using them, we wanted to make sure that we weren't gonna see machine to machine variation. So what we did was we did, we conducted a um, in-lab validation, right? So we did single plex and duplex. So what we, uh, and what Seth did is that he took uh, cultures that we had in the lab, Microcystis originosa LE3, which is a microsystem producer, and Plankothrix agardii, which is another microsystem producer. He uh, extracted and then he diluted the extract to a final concentration of two micrograms per liter as measured using the uh, benchtop ELISA. He then also uh, extracted Cylindrospermopsin from Cylindrospermopsis rathaborski ICS506 from Australia. Um, and then again, he diluted that down to a final concentration of 1.5 micrograms per liter. We also then wanted to look at a duplex um, validation where we essentially did the same thing, but we had, instead of just measuring one toxin at a time, we had an extract that had both toxins at the same concentrations as what I just mentioned. So two and 1.5 micrograms per liter. So then we took that common lysate, that common extract, and we ran cartridges on each individual uh, unit. And what we found is that between all 15 units, uh, we, with whether it's microcystin, which are the two bars on the left, uh, we found that they were reasonably accurate. You know, two micrograms per liter. Um, we had, uh, you know, 1.5, you know, and about 1.8 with, uh, with decent uh, standard error. And with the uh, expected some of the it was very close for uh, CS506, right? So it was about 1.3, 1.4 with some error. So we felt confident that any uh, differences we saw out in the lake was not just from machine to machine variation. We also, with the duplex, again, we found very similar results. So it wasn't just a single plex assay when we looked at both toxins at the same time. Again, we found very similar results. Um, this is from Microcystis originos LE3 and CS506. Um, the results were comparable to the single plex assay. So it doesn't look like there was much um, uh, or any interaction or inhibition uh, between the two different uh, toxins, which we wouldn't expect. So then once we had validated those in the lab, we sent them to our partners. And in 2020, we worked with the Toledo and Port Clinton water treatment plant operators, the Maumee Beach State Park beach managers, and the NOAA Phytoplankton Monitoring Network. This past summer, we also added in the Cleveland Water Alliance Citizen Science Partners, which you can see here in the upper right. In 2020, because everything is virtual these days, um, what I wanted to show is that we conducted a half day virtual training workshop for all participants. So we had 27 uh, folks from 11 different groups and we sent them all uh, aliquots of a common lysate Seth went through and he demonstrated how to use the machine. And then we had each individual partner run a cartridge on their own. And what I wanted to, to highlight is that within a half day training, all groups got essentially the same result on the first attempt. So it did kind of highlight the ease of use, as well as again, it was a secondary validation that even as these units get moved around and by different users, we were still able to get very similar results on the first try. So once we had the machines validated and the partners trained, we then went and uh, last year we collected over 300 samples. Uh, you can see here from all the different groups around Western Lake Erie, whether it was through routine monitoring from the academic groups or the citizen science partners. And um, the sampling occurred from June through October. So after the sampling season, we went back and we started to analyze the data. And 
what I wanted to show is if you start on left-hand figure, there was good correlation um, with some groups, but not with others, right? So there were some discrepancies there. And we want to be upfront with this because this isn't a magic bullet yet. It's a very interesting piece of technology that has a lot of promise, but we, have, we had to work out some kinks between last year and this year. So this is data from uh, Justin Chaffin at Ohio State. And what he did was he didn't actually use the MQ algae lice. He used the uh, freeze thaw. And what we found is that there was very good correlation between the light deck uh, toxin concentrations and ELISA toxin concentrations. All right, so it was it was fairly good. It was about 0.65, which when you look at uh, ELISA tests, you know I'll take that as a, as an R squared. However, when we lumped all the data from all the different groups, so all 300 data points together, what we found is that the correlation wasn't as good. Actually, it was pretty bad. And what we found is that early in the season, so we identified each uh, sample from when it was from when it was collected and analyzed, so June, July through September. Um, and what we found is that early in the season, we actually, um, the toxin concentrations on the benchtop ELISA were higher than the light deck, right? So we thought that, oh, okay, maybe there's some sort of a congener issue, right? Because there's multiple congeners um, in any given lake at any time of microcystin. But we also had uh, a lot of uh, late season false positives where the light, deck uh, the, the light deck unit was measuring microcystins when the ELISA would come up as negative. Now, I'm only showing you microcystin data because we never got a positive cylindrospermopsin hit in Lake Erie, which is not a normal. Greg Gore has been looking for cylindrospermopsins for years and has only gotten them a handful of times. So we wanted to figure out why we were having these issues. Why did the correlations break down when we lumped all the data together? And what we found, at least in Sandusky Bay, where we, see, where we were seeing a lot of these false positives uh, in 2020, um, this is some data from Sandusky Bay from 2018 end of 2020. What I want you to really highlight or focus on are the blue-green algae and the diatoms. So typically in Sandusky Bay, we get this shift from uh, diatoms um, in, in April and May to blue-green algae starting uh, late May and then through October. Planktrix dominates and has for many years, except for last year and again this year, unfortunately. Um, what we found is that um, with the gray and the yellow bars, this is 2020, um, it was an atypical year. So the blue and the orange bars um, kind of show a typical year from that, that shift from diatoms to blue green. Well, in 2020, we never saw that shift. Diatoms were dominant in Sandusky Bay throughout the bloom season. And we actually didn't see a cyanobacterial bloom uh, form in, in Sandusky Bay. And again, that's, that's happening again this year. So in conversations with uh, Sarah Bickman at Light Deck, there has been some indication that silica might be uh, in, interfering, might have uh, might, might be causing these false positives that we were seeing in Sandusky Bay. So we got really concerned with this, obviously, because there's silica everywhere. So we wanted to make sure that silica was not interfering with the assay. So what we did, and, and Seth did, is that over winter, we took a couple of different diatoms, Alicacyra granulata, which is a common diatom that we see out in Western Lake Erie during the summer, and uh, Nitsia um, species. And what we, we took um, various different tests. So we looked at media just to make sure that, you know, dissolved silica in the media wasn't uh, causing a false positive. We also took whole culture um, and we also concentrated that culture. So we just wanted to see if the presence of diatoms and diatom crustules and silica in the water would cause false positives. And you can see here um, with all these tests that they were negative for both um, Alicacyra and Nitsia outside of this one singular sample um, from a concentrated sample. So it was pretty clear that, that diatoms and silica were not uh, interfering uh, with the assay, which, is, which is, was frustrating for us, but also kind of re a relief for us because um, you know, that would have been very difficult to deal with. So in additional conversations and over a lot of work uh, in, in over the past winter, um, what we did is that uh, Light Deck ended up redesigning and re-engineering their cartridge. And these are data, these are kind of fresh off the, uh, 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 press data. Um, and what we see here is that the old cartridge, this is, these are the cartridges that were used last year um, in sampling on four different dates. We can see that the old cartridges were giving us a bunch of false positives. And we know that toxins weren't present because blue green algae concentrations and measured through the floor probe were almost at zero. Um, however, the new cartridge design on those same dates, so we took the same water, 
um, the same extract and we ran them on the old cartridge and the new cartridge, what we're seeing is that the new design of the cartridge, which of course is proprietary, um, is giving us fewer false positives, if any. They are all down around the detection limit of what we would expect for these cartridges. So they're all at or below detection limit. So it seems like uh, the newer uh, assay, uh, cartridge assay has been improving um, or at least reducing the false positives. So we're still in those comparisons this year. We just ended our, our sampling yesterday. Uh, so we'll be updating those data as they come. But what I also wanted to say is in parallel with this, so not only are we testing the unit and testing the current assay through a NOAA PCM uh, HAB funded project uh, that was awarded to Light Deck Diagnostics, we're looking to try to multiplex. So going from microsystems and slosmopsins to being able to measure all four major the cyanotoxins on the same cartridge. So microcystins, lindosomopsins, anatoxin, and saxotoxins on the same cartridge. So that work is just beginning, um, and I don't have any data on that yet. So I'm gonna, that was just kind of a preview of what's coming. Um, but hopefully as we have improved the assay design and, and have been able to deal with these false positives that we were seeing, we'll get a much better correlation this year um, and be able to have a lot more confidence in those cartridges. And then once we do, we can start to, to build and develop those cartridges. So um, the conclusions are that, you know, again, this is a technology that is still, you know, in development. It's commercially available and the cartridges are commercially available um, and it is easy to use. It's rapid. Um, you can, we often uh, take our samples and we extract them and analyze them right on our vessel. Um, we saw that the freestyle results showed a good positive correlation um, in last year's samples. Um, as, a, as opposed to the MQ algae lice, again, which isn't commercially available. Um, but again, that, that newer cartridge design seems to have dealt with those false positives. Um, there were some false positives that were reported with the mechanical lice samples and, and the dissolved toxins. Um, and luckily, what we were able to show is that silica is not an interferon and that that new assay design seems to be yielding fewer false positives, um, if any. So hopefully we've, we've gotten that taken care of and the data this year will be uh, um, much better than, than last year. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to just thank everyone um, that was involved in this project. It's really a large collaborative effort um, between the, our BGSU team here, all the grad students who were involved, our citizen scientists and other collaborators such as Justin um, and his team, uh, Heidi and, and Tom Johengen um, and, and Regan Herrera and Noah Glural and Sigler, Ed Brahami um, at Limnotech, and of course, uh, Tom Bridgman um, Amber and Brenda at University of Toledo. So with that, I'll take any questions and hopefully I was able to catch up a little bit on our time. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we're still bumping up a good time. So we've got about three minutes for some questions. So uh, one question did come in just uh, before you ended. Uh, the cost estimate of initial purchase of a unit and annual upkeep, I think you said 7,000 was for the, for the chip reader and then about 25 bucks per chip. Um, so that's the number. Is there a uh, upkeep costs associated with that. Um, so I know those numbers were put in your presentation, but what about the upkeep? Yeah, so at this point, it doesn't, um, there's not like an annual maintenance uh, that we've been doing on them. Uh, you know, unless uh, a machine starts starts reading or acting, um, or, you know, in a way that um, is not, um, that, that we're seeing, it, it, you know, something gets knocked out of alignment somehow, you know, the unit gets dropped and has to get sent back in. Uh, but no, there's no annual uh, maintenance on those to my knowledge, we, we've only sent back units where, you know, it, just through some uh, in-lab testing, we know that the, the units weren't reading properly and it had to do with some alignment issues that, that uh, Light Deck was helping us with inside the unit. So, um, you know, we also know that there's a temperature issue, right? So these, these units at, at current are temperature controlled. So if you get out in, and you have these in, you know, middle of July in the middle of the sun and the unit heats up, uh, that is going to impact your results. So again, you know these are field portable, but you have to deal with the uh, with the heat and and sometimes uh, with the heat issue is mainly the the main issue that can impact your results. And Tim, just to kind of follow on the on the line of the discussion about this equipment, I see that you know that seven thousand dollars is for that chip reader, but you had mentioned that the extraction device is not commercially available yet. And then, but in your conclusions, you say the freeze thaw method is comparable. But that introduces a, a time component here, right? That extraction device is supposed to be able to get that intracellular toxins out to be detected by the reader within, you know, that 10 or 15 minutes. So as soon as you go to the freeze thaw, 
because that device isn't commercially available. That lengthens the time for results. So is there any discussion yeah. on what's going on in that uh, the, the, the extraction device and where, where do you think that is as far as being available commercially? Yeah, so I would, my personal opinion is not, not, not close. Um, so yeah, they're, they're recommending the freeze thaw um, right now if you're using these units. Um, again, you know, once you go through the freeze thaw though, um, you know, just the ELISA um, test alone takes, you know, you know, several hours to complete. So you're still saving time, right? So even if you're doing the freeze, the three freeze thaws, so even if you did go back out and you had to do the, put in the freezer, take it out, thaw, put in the freezer, take it out, you know, once you have your sample extract, once you put that, you know, and mix that with the reagents and put that onto the chip, you have results in about 10 minutes um, versus, you know, three to four hours. So yes, it does introduce a time component. The MQ algae lice uh, is not commercially available and there's some, you know, tweaks that they're looking to make um, with that unit. So yes, it does introduce a time component. That's why I'm saying this is a promising technology. It's not one that I can throw 100% support behind, even though we're working with it. I think it has a lot of, of potential and, you know, Light Deck has been fantastic with working with us um, and, they, and they recognize, you know, they, they're not out there saying, you know, this is perfect and there's no need for any, you know, improvements. They're actively working with us to improve both the reader, the cartridge and the extraction unit. And then Tim, I, we're at time, but I'm going to make Jay Martin angry with me and ask because the other one that came in was good. Is is the has any validation been done in those ranges of microcystin that are recreation impairment ranges? I know the ones that you guys were testing for false positives were kind of on the lower microcystin range. Have you done some higher tests? And again, if, short and brief on the answer because we want to yeah, get to a break. Absolutely. Uh, the 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 standard, you know the. Um, the range of these units is similar to the range of the uh, of the Abraxas um, benchtop ELISA units, right? So around 0.5 to 5 micrograms per liter. Um, anything higher than that, you would have to dilute, similar to the Abraxas ELISA test. So um, no, at this point, they were they were trying to match the um, uh, the standard range of the Abraxas um, benchtop ELISA. Tim, thanks for that. Uh, that's where we're going to cut it off again. I'm, I apologize. We are getting a lot of questions that we just don't have time to answer on, on the call today, but I would uh, encourage you to stick around or re-log in, but we will start back up at 1230. So lunch on your own, everybody, and we'll get back together at 1230 and roll into our second session of uh, speakers. So thank you to everybody that was in the first round. So Hans and Justin and Tim and, and Sylvia, thanks for great presentations. And we'll see everybody back at uh, 1230. Thank you. Chris Winslow here. We're going to get started. Uh, just wanted to show everybody the screen here. Just remind that we have a save the date uh, for this meeting next year, September 7th. We're hoping by that time that we will be able to do this in person and not virtually. Um, I will let you know that uh, Chris and Fussell, Dr. Fussell is going to come on and, and MC the second half of today's event. Um, but we don't have the luxury of having a lunch to, to leak into if, if talks go long. So I'm going to be uh, very much regimented about when talks end. So again, we may not get all of the questions that come through the chat function um, or that were submitted ahead of time. Um, but hopefully most of your questions will be resolved during those presentations. Um, so with that, we are recording again, and we will get this information posted up on our website um, after the event. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kristen Fussell to introduce uh, our next speaker. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Uh, yeah, so welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you're all properly refueled and ready to go for the second half of the State of the Science <laughs> Harmful Algal Blooms Virtual Conference. Um, Leading off this such session, which now we're focusing a little bit more on phosphorus. Uh, the first session was very nitrogen heavy. Um, we have Deanna Osman coming to us from North Carolina State University. Uh, Deanna is a professor and department extension leader in soil and crop management at NC State. Uh, her research is focused on agricultural production and the reduction of agricultural pollutants through the use of conservation practices and the development of decision support systems. 
Deanna's talk today is titled Phosphorus Losses, Sources, Pathways, and Trade-offs. So Deanna, with that, if you wanna start sharing your screen, we'll make sure everything's working. That looks great. Okay, great. Well, Perfect. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that introduction and good day to everyone or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And before I begin my talk, I really wanna thank the organizing committee for inviting us to talk. And I wanna acknowledge my co-authors, Andrew Sharpley, Nathan Nelson, Amy Schober, and Pete Kleinman. Okay, this is not moving. Any ideas, folks? Yeah, Deanna, can you scroll down to the bottom left of your screen? Maybe you can use the, there, there's some arrows that, shh, try yes. that now. Yep, that's great. Thank you for that little tip. I really appreciate you're, it. You're welcome. So um, we wanna talk about the problems of phosphorus, but before we get into that, just note that it's really important for crop production. Um, and when the phosphorus leaves the fields, we end up with these problems that were really well described by Dr. Pearl and a number of other researchers this morning. And so what we want to look at is the way phosphorus leaves agricultural fields and potential solutions. So when the water uh, comes down the soil, we can have erosion, which has dissolved, which I'm sorry, which has particulate phosphorus attached to it, or we can have runoff, which takes the very top layer of phosphorus in the soil that becomes dissolved. Vegetation also releases dissolved phosphorus. And so we have runoff losses of dissolved phosphorus. In some places, we have significant phosphorus leaching through the soil and into either tile flows or into streams themselves. So these three loss pathways, soil erosion with particulate P, dissolved phosphorus, and phosphorus leaching make up the total phosphorus loss. But we also have to consider the sources of phosphorus we add, which might be agricultural um, animal waste, or it may be commercial phosphorus fertilizers. But again, the loss of the materials that we add can get lost through the three loss pathways. So I'd like to talk about the loss pathways and the sources of phosphorus. But before I do that, I want to talk about the conservation practice construct that we're going to use for this talk. This is the construct that Natural Resources Conservation Service uses. We're going to avoid phosphorus loss through the use of nutrient management to prevent overfertilization and legacy phosphorus. We're going to control the phosphorus as it goes through the field with practices like conservation tillage and cover crops. And last but not least, we're going to trap phosphorus in wetlands and vegetative buffers. So if you put these three words together, um, they have the acronym of, of um, ACT. So we're gonna act by putting conservation practices on the ground as a system of practices. But it's really important to recognize that conservation practices can have potential trade-offs. So for instance, we might use a conservation practice that's very good at reducing nitrogen, only to find out that it loads more phosphorus. Or a practice that reduces dissolved phosphorus, but in fact increases particulate phosphorus. And we may partition the water so that we're changing it from surface flow to subsurface flow, which can affect the phosphorus that it carries with it. And so we have to acknowledge these potential trade-offs and how they affect the effectiveness of conservation practices. So getting back to talking about phosphorus loss sources and their pathways, before I actually talk about the pathways, I wanna talk about the importance of legacy phosphorus or soil test phosphorus. Although soil test phosphorus may not be a reliable indicator of the risk of phosphorus loss, as we see with the graph on your left, where we have phosphorus runoff on the y-axis and increasing soil test phosphorus on the x-axis, 
in many situations, there is an increase in phosphorus loss as we increase soil test phosphorus. So if all conditions are the same, as soil test phosphorus increases, so too is going to increase our loss of phosphorus. Um, a couple months ago, about nine months ago, actually, I was getting ready to give a presentation to CCAs. And I wanted to talk about fertilizer phosphorus versus legacy phosphorus risk. And I came across this excellent paper by Emily Duncan, who was a postdoc in Kevin King's lab um, within the Lake Erie Basin. And this is a really nice study looking at the relationship between soil test phosphorus and dissolved, re um, dissolved reactive phosphorus concentrations and loads for 68 site years of data. And just to orient everybody, the horizontal dashed line is the target threshold above which you don't wanna be. The open symbols are the fields that had no fertilizer, phosphorus fertilizer applied, and the closed symbols are the fields that did have fertilizer applied. Now, we're not gonna talk about quadrant A or B because of time limitations. I really wanna focus on dissolved reactive phosphorus loads, which are on the Y axis and increasing soil test phosphorus on the X axis. And the C quadrant is the spring dissolved reactive phosphorus load versus soil test. Um, and when you look at those fields where there was no fertilizer applied, there's very good relationship, an R squared of 0.87 between the two indicators. On the other hand, when fertilizer is applied, phosphorus fertilizer is applied, the relationship is much more, um, much less robust at only 0.18. When we're looking at dissolved reactive phosphorus loads for the entire water year, and I'm sorry, I should have said C was for the spring loads, but for the entire water year, we see the relationship between soil test phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus loads is even higher at, with an R square of 0.92. And the relationship between fertilizer phosphorus and loss of dissolved reactive phosphorus is slightly better than it was just for spring, but still it's only an R square of 0.34. So it shows the importance of legacy phosphorus and why it's really important not to build up soil test phosphorus. Because the problem is the only way to get rid of high soil test phosphorus is through drawdown. These are some data, although they're a little old, they're a great data set, 15 years of soybean corn, soybean corn, Malik 3P, soil test phosphorus on the Y axis, years of cropping on the X axis. No phosphorus was applied up to 40 pounds. There was no difference in yield, yield excuse me, when phosphorus was applied or it wasn't applied. And if you put no phosphorus on this field, it would easily take 30 years before drawdown would show that you might need phosphorus applications. And this data set from Delaware is very similar, except the soil test phosphorus is even higher. The legacy phosphorus is even higher. And in this situation, it's going to take decades before you need additional phosphorus. So we're going to move from legacy phosphorus to source control. And source control, as I already mentioned, is a way to avoid phosphorus losses through nutrient management. The four R's of nutrient stewardship is an excellent way to look at the right source, the right rate, the right time, and the right place. But those four R's are highly interrelated. One of the things I wanna say about the Lake Erie Basin is that you have just a remarkably effective, in my opinion, um, example of four R nutrient stewardship. Uh, it's an excellent role model for the entire country. So let's talk about the four R's and let's start with source because source is really important because it affects placement, timing, and rate. And the rate is critical for reducing phosphorus losses. If you don't need phosphorus then you're, and you don't put it on, then you're not going to lose it. So it needs to be based on soil testing and land-grant university nutrient recommendations. The problem is that when you have organic sources, do you put it on, on a nitrogen basis, which over applies phosphorus, 
or a phosphorus base, which underapplies nitrogen. The timing is also critical. Phosphorus should go on in the season that you're growing your crop. And obviously wet weather and frozen soils is problematic. One of the issues around organic sources, and typically what we're talking about is animal waste, is to ensure that you have adequate storage. And for some producers, this may mean an entire year of storage, which is really expensive. And then last but not least, if you can get your materials into the soil, you're better off all around uh, relative to phosphorus losses. But depending on your system, you may be incorporating it on the surface, putting it on the surface and then trying to incorporate it in. Unfortunately, for particular fields, by incorporating it, you may be changing soluble phosphorus loss to a sediment phosphorus loss. And so these are some of the trade-offs you have to think about even when you're talking about nutrient management. Now I'm gonna talk about rate and placement real quickly relative to organic sources. I've always tried to work with fertilizer or phosphorus because it's much easier to manage than organic sources. And part of this is because manures are unbalanced in their nitrogen to phosphorus relative to what crops need. So again, if you're going to try and manage phosphorus to keep your legacy phosphorus from getting very high, it's very advantageous because it lowers water quality trade-offs. However, it increases the cost of doing business. And so it's difficult oftentimes for producers to use a phosphorus-based application. I also wanna talk about the interrelatedness of rate and placement. So on the graph here, you see total phosphorus concentration and runoff on the Y axis and poultry litter application rate on the X axis. And when the poultry litter is incorporated, there's really not much difference between the lowest application rates and the highest application rates relative to the amount of phosphorus in the runoff. However, for surface applied phosphorus, surface applied poultry litter, it increases greatly as you increase your rates. So again, the four R's are very interrelated when it comes to applying organic sources. This is some placement information. Again, we're looking at incorporation versus no incorporation. The left graph shows dissolved phosphorus on the y-axis and the amount of swine manure that's being applied. And regardless of whether you're working at the, looking at the 24-hour event or the 15-day event, if you can incorporate the swine manure you can reduce phosphorus runoff. The graph on the right shows dissolved reactive phosphorus from chisel plow where you've uh, moved your phosphorus, your animal waste into the soil a bit versus surface applying it from no-till. And of course you have much lower dissolved reactive phosphorus with chisel plow. However, you have these trade-offs because the minute you chisel plow, you expose the soil and you have greater sediment losses than you do for the no-till. So we have to keep these trade-offs in mind when we're using nutrient management. Let's talk about erosion control. And before I talk about practices that control erosion, I wanna talk about the importance of soil test phosphorus and texture relative to phosphorus loss. These data just happen to be from North Carolina, but they could be from many different other places in the country. On the y-axis, you have the total amount of phosphorus that's lost in pounds of phosphorus per ton. Um, and in the x-axis, you have soil test phosphorus. I just want to show what happens at, for instance, a malic 3 of 100. On a clay textured soil, when you lose a ton of sediment, you're losing 15 times more phosphorus than when you lose a ton of sandy textured soil that has a malic 3P of 100. So looking at phosphorus that's lost through erosion, you need to know the amount that's eroded, you need to know the texture of your soil, and you need to know your soil test phosphorus. So what kind of practices are effective? Well, conservation tillage, cover crops and buffers, those are the three I'm gonna talk about. And then there's also terraces and grassed waterways. 
This is a meta-analysis from Darianto. I really like this study. The left graph shows changes in phosphorus concentration. The right graph shows changes in phosphorus load. The graphs are not too dissimilar at all, and it shows the effects of no-till uh, versus conventional till on particulate P and total P, where you see a decrease in particulate P and total P because of conservation tillage. But on the same hand, you see an increase in dissolved phosphorus. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at load or you're looking at concentration. So again, you see these trade-offs when you're using conservation practices between particulate P, total P, and dissolved P. I wanna talk about the effects of cover crops on sediment. There's a lot of research that's being done. This work is out of Nathan Nelson's lab. He's got four years of data. And these little watershed fields had no cover crop or cover crop. And so all four years, the no cover crop field loaded more sediment. It had more erosion than the cover crop fields. So this seems very encouraging. I'm gonna wait until we talk about runoff phosphorus to talk about the rest of this study. And riparian buffers or vegetative buffers have shown to be very effective at reducing sediment. There are thousands of studies on the effectiveness of riparian buffers and sediment reduction. This, these two data sets come from Georgia and North Carolina. And this is typical, it shows the biggest bang for your buck in dropping out sediment is definitely within the first 30 to 50 feet. And in this meta-analysis where they looked at phosphorus reductions through riparian buffers, they found that riparian buffers do a great job of removing total phosphorus. So that is, it's really good at removing that sediment. And the range was 32 to 93%. However, soluble phosphorus is a very different situation in that in some instances, the buffers were able to reduce soluble phosphorus, and in some instances, they actually loaded soluble phosphorus. And I'm going to come back to this point a little bit later. So again, you see these trade-offs. Next, we're going to talk about runoff control. And just like we talked about erosion control, needing to know the soil texture and the soil test phosphorus, we also need to know this for dissolved phosphorus. Again, this graph is from North Carolina, but it could be from many different locations where you see at the same soil test level of 100 malic 3P that three times as much pho dissolved phosphorus is lost from the sandy textured soil as from the clay textured soil. So soil texture is really important in considering phosphorus losses. What kind of practices can we use to uh, deal with soluble phosphorus and runoff. And I'm just going to go to the punchline, which is to say, we don't have many solutions. If you have an agricultural field that has one outlet and you can put this system with slag on it, which can sorb the soluble phosphorus that runs over it, um, then you have a great conservation practice. The problem is most of our agricultural fields aren't set up that way. There are some data showing that for controlled drainage, if you manage it correctly, it can reduce runoff and therefore it reduces the phosphorus that tags along with the runoff. What about cover crops? So this is where I wanted to show you the data out of Nathan N Nelson's lab for dissolved reactive phosphorus, that's the graph on your left and total phosphorus, that's the graph on your right. What he found was that three out of the four years there was more dissolved reactive phosphorus from the fields that have cover crops on them than the fields that did not have cover crops. When he looked at total phosphorus, he found that two years there was no difference in the total phosphorus loads from no cover crop and cover crop fields. In 2018, cover crops actually loaded more total phosphorus. And in 2019, the results were completely reversed with the no-till with the no cover crop uh, field loading more total phosphorus. And that was because of the very heavy rainfall and the sediment losses. The reason I really like this slide is it shows um, in, in just one field in one area, the kind of variation that you get with cover crop data relative to the reduction of soluble phosphorus. 
some of the literature out there shows increases, some of it shows decreases, and um, some of it shows no difference. There are data that show that as you have more freeze-thaw cycles, you increase your soluble phosphorus losses. So again, there just aren't many tools to deal with soluble phosphorus. What about leaching control? Just like I talked about the importance of soil texture and soil test phosphorus for erosion and uh, runoff, I also want to show this graph that has to do with soil test phosphorus, soil texture, and leaching losses. The two soils that are sandy texture are the triangle symbol and the circle symbol. The other two soils are have some clay in them. The high soil test phosphorus are the closed symbols. The low soil test phosphorus are the open symbols. The left graph is cumulative loss of total dissolved phosphorus. The right graph is total, excuse me, cumulative loss of total phosphorus. Note they are both in the same units, kilograms per hectare. And they leached these soil columns for eight weeks without applying manure. And there was a lot of phosphorus being leached from these really sandy textured soils that had very high soil test phosphorus. You don't see much leaching loss differences between the other soils regardless of soil test. But the minute they applied manure, you could start seeing breakthrough, particularly for the um, open circle field, which was a sandy texture. So again, they're showing this relationship between texture and leaching losses. I would be remiss if I didn't say that one has to be careful when translating this particular slide to, for instance, the Lake Erie Basin. The clays in um, that they were using, these soils were from Delaware. Clays are one-to-one. -one. They don't they are not structured clays. When you start getting into structured clays, montmorillonitic clays or smectitic clays, the clays can also move a lot of phosphorus through them and cause these losses through leaching and subsurface. So I don't wanna make the mistake of thinking that all clays are the same across the country. So what kind of control do we have for leaching losses? Um, if we can get the phosphorus in intimate contact with the soil through subsurface placement, it is very helpful. One of the proposed practices has been to lightly till fields to break up the macropores. But for those folks that are in long-term no-till, this is not going to be um, a solution that they'd be happy with. And so, we just have to try and get our phosphorus in other ways rather than tilling if we're in long-term no-till. And the data on controlled drainage are mixed. Sometimes it shows that it reduces leaching losses and sometimes it shows that it increases leaching losses. So I just wanna say that we've talked already today in this presentation about trade-offs. And there are a group of people, and I've listed them here, that are working to do a literature review of trade-offs of phosphorus around conservation practices. Um, this is a star-studded group. They have a great deal of expertise, and we're in the process of putting together a peer-reviewed journal article, as well as a fa fact sheet, and we hope to get those out within the next six months. So I talked earlier about conservation practice systems, the avoid, control, or trap, or the act system. But one of the things that I've mentioned throughout this presentation is that we have these trade-offs. So we've seen that conservation tillage can reduce sediment-attached phosphorus while increasing soluble phosphorus runoffs. Likewise, cover crops can reduce sediment but may increase soluble phosphorus. Wetlands and vegetative buffers can move from being sinks of phosphorus to sources of phosphorus. Um, a postdoc with Dr. Sharpley had just a wonderful paper. Um, it, it was actually a literature review showing how these wetlands and vegetative buffers can move from being sinks to sources. And, and so with that, I wanna 
I want to uh, close by saying that controlling phosphorus, its sources, pathways, and considering its trade-offs is seriously complicated. It's also very site-specific. Um, I had the privilege of leading a NIFA seep watershed assessment, which was funded by not only NIFA, but also the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And we looked at 13 watersheds across the country from which we were able to draw a lot of lessons learned. Um, I just wanna do a shout out that Rock Creek was one of those 13 watersheds that we looked at and had so much information that helped us with this synthesis. But I'm gonna boil down our um, five years worth of work into five bullets. It's critically important to identify the pollutant or pollutants of concern before you even think about conservation practices. Once you understand your pollutants of concern and their hydrology, the way they're transported, then you can start thinking about conservation practices. And it's critically important to think about the trade-off effects of these practices as you're identifying what needs to go into your watershed. The other thing that's very important is to try and identify source areas. So you're putting your conservation practices in the areas where they're going to be most effective. However, for tile drain watersheds, your entire tile drain watershed may be the critical source area. And then last but not least, and I think this is so critically important as an extension specialist, I think it is perhaps, per, perhaps I should have started with this lesson learned is that we have to work with our farmers and their partners in trying to understand the economics and sociology of conservation practices. It is a very complicated decision for them um, as they go about their daily activities. So um, we just wanted to make sure that we recognize the impact of Dave Baker. He provided so much research and so many resources to the Lake Erie watershed, and he was um, instrumental to a number of the people's careers um, on this presentation. And with that, um, I think I'm on time and I can take questions if anyone has them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. This is Chris Winslow. Can you hear me? I can. Great. So there were a couple coming through in the chat. There's going to be more than we can get to in the time that we have for your slot today, but I'll start ticking my way through here. So um, in the study showing effectiveness of vegetative buffers and reducing phosphorus, did that study uh, evaluate subsurface drain tile fields with vegetative buffers? I've always considered vegetative buffers as being more impactful in agricultural systems that are non-tile drained. Let me just say that um, almost all the papers do not look at tile drained watersheds because to me it's almost an oxymoron, right? If your surface pathway is primarily through your tile drains, if you've got a surface practice, it's not going to be effective. So yes, um, the meta-analysis I'm sure probably did not consider tile drains. Thank you for that. Uh, sure. Another question here, with so much variability in the effectiveness of BMPs, depending on site-specific conditions, is there a good summary available for field staff to use in recommending the best P loss reduction practices given a site's soil type, slope, climate, crop rotation? And, and I'm sure, I think you referenced that, you know, kind of the summary that you're working towards, but Deanna, I, I turn to you to answer that question. Wow. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we had a decision tool, you know? Um, maybe that's what this group needs to do next. Now, I, I, one of the things that I would seriously suggest for folks is reach out to your researchers in your own state who are working on conservation practices. Um, one of the things that I see all too often is um, folks want to come into my part of the world with these fantastic conservation practices that work in their part of the country and, and they're not appropriate and they don't work for, for our part of the country. So I would say the best way to look at different conservation practices is to work with your uh, land grant faculty that are looking at conservation practices. Or if you're really lucky to have an ARS group like Kevin King's, go talk to them. 
Uh, another one here, is there research being done on capturing and transforming the legacy phosphorus to be utilized by crops? So um, any, do you know of any work, any work in that space? Um, well, you know, the two, no, I mean, if, if they're asking, is there work to try and increase the rate at which we get phosphorus taken up by crops so we can get it out of the field quicker? The only thing I would say is that some folks are trying to grow biofuels um, and then uh, actually take the, the, the biofuel biomass out of the field so that you're not just recycling phosphorus back through the, the soil and through the rhizomes. So that's the only research I know about trying to pull out legacy phosphorus in a quicker way. Thank you. Uh, another question, would you recommend vegetative buffers in conjunction with other best management practices? I would recommend as many practices as make sense economically and logistically. Um, I, I think we underestimate the importance of conservation systems. We need as much redundancy as possible. And the one thing I didn't talk about, um, Dr. Pearl talked about this. He talked about climate change, the increase in rainfall, the increase in intensity of storms. I know that in the Lake Erie Basin, you've had a lot of increase in rainfall and intensity of storms. And one of the things we're gonna to have to really pay attention to is our conservation practices were designed for a different climate system. And so we're gonna to have to have more redundancy to even begin to touch some of these really big storms that are coming through. Thanks for that. And, you know, I always, you know, when giving talks like this, and, and I think you do the same is that we keep calling these best management practices, but there isn't a best, right? No. These, these are management practices and it really That's right. truly depends on what field and what circumstances you're in. So, um, you know, that kind of misleads folks occasionally. Um, there is a, more of a, a good news uh, statement in here, but maybe you can back it up. We're seeing somebody say, just to give a bit of good news, we do see no-till farmers doing light vertical till to incorporate fertilizer. Banding is fairly common practice in Ontario. So are you seeing more banding um, happening in, in your work too? I, you know, again, this is so site specific and it depends on how focused the farmers are on this issue. My hunch is in Ontario, they're seriously focused on this issue. Um, in my part of the world, they're not seriously focused on this issue. We don't have any sticks and we don't have many carrots. And a lot of our farmers um, actually, uh, it's cheaper for them just to apply it on the surface. So it, again, this is highly specific on the area. And I think you referred to that when we think of trade-offs, it's not trade-offs just in, in where the loss will be at particulate versus DRP, but there are, you know, those are the decisions that are weighing in. Is it the time component trade-off for, for producers and it's a cost trade-off for, for producers? Absolutely. And, and thank you for bringing up that trade-offs are also with the, the farmer's production system. Yeah, we know that those toolbars that are needed to do some of that incorporation are not, are not cheap. And I've been even hearing from producers that the equipment they have is not strong enough to pull some of those toolbars. So these, these are- That's these are... absolutely true too. I mean, all of those are factors. Good. Uh, there was another question in here and I don't know, um, do you know, this might be outside of your warehouse, but question about how good our, our DRP measurements are at really getting DRP loads and runoffs. There might be some, are we getting DRP that is actually really particulate phosphorus that goes through the filters? Uh, so I think it's talking more about pore size. Yeah, I think I'm gonna let some other folks take that one on. Okay. Um, knowing that we're, we're on time here and I don't want to get us off because uh, we want to make sure we give our sp other speakers enough time. And again, we have a hard stop on this one. We don't have the luxury of cutting into your <laughs> lunch, whether you folks like that or not. Um, so we're going to move on. But I, I can't thank you enough. The number of questions that came in um, were really great. So thank you very much. For no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, Kristen, I'm going to uh, turn it back to, to you, um, and we'll go into our next speaker, so please. Yep, thanks, Chris. Uh, we're going to move on to our, our next speaker uh, for the second session here. Uh, next up, we have Tiffany Kavalek. She's the Chief of the Division of Surface Water at the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. 
Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Tiffany and her staff on a number of different initiatives and panels, um, and I am consistently impressed uh, by all they do. But today, Tiffany is going to be talking to us about the Ohio EPA overview of the TMDL status and nine element plan. Thank you very much. Let me try You're to welcome. share my screen. All right, there it is. Then I will. I'm beginning. Then I will. So if we go to display settings again up at the top, I think you can. Um... Yeah, now that I'm in the Zoom, I don't have that option. It's behind it. Let me see. There it is. It was hidden. Okay. <laughs> there we go. That looks great. <laughs> yeah, we're seeing it perfectly. And your audio is great too, Tiffany. Okay. So it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much. And what a great talk, Deanna. Um, we are in Ohio, very, very focused on DRP. Um, at least we're focused to learn how to better manage it. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. It is unfortunate that we're not in person, but uh, to Kristen and Chris, I think the wide audience that you were able to garner today is uh, well beyond anyone's expectations. So um, as Kristen said, I'm Tiffany Kavalak. I'm the chief of the Division of Surface Water at Ohio EPA. And I have been asked to talk about two of our active programs, the Mommy Watershed Nutrient Total Maximum Daily Load, or TMDL, and our ongoing efforts to promote non-point source nutrient reductions via our nine element plans. But first, I've been asked by Director Stevenson to provide a quick overview of some of our H2 Ohio investments in Ohio EPA's year two or 2021 efforts. The green areas highlight drinking water infrastructure projects and the orange highlights the wastewater infrastructure investments. These projects are mostly running water lines into disadvantaged areas that are on well water and running sewer lines into neighborhoods with failing home septic systems. And we were able to cover a good part of the state last year. Large investments were made to the local health departments in the Western Lake Erie Basin with our year one H2 Ohio funding while our year two provided funding to 11 other counties throughout the state for replacement of failing home septic systems. And as most of you are already know, Ohio EPA secured another 10 million per year for 2022 and 2023. We do plan to continue emphasis on water and wastewater infrastructure removing lead in drinking water, and continuing to replace failed home septic systems. Ohio EPA also had a large role in developing scoring criteria for the American Rescue Act. We call that the ARPA. I'm trying to get my cursor up on this other screen. Um, that's funding that's available through the Ohio Department of Development and we're now assisting with application reviews. A lot of communities have applied for up to $5 million uh, in infrastructure grants or $250,000 in design grants. And we've already received over a thousand applications. And this is just a reminder that we have approximately 800 million available annually through our state revolving fund programs and that could increase dramatically with the passage of the proposed federal infrastructure bill. Before discussing the Mommy Watershed Nutrient TMDL specifically, I'd like to orient the audience on what Ohio's TMDL process is. Total maximum daily loads are performed for surface waters that are not meeting water quality goals. We call these 
water's impaired. Kristen, are you seeing pop-ups that are coming on my screen? Um, I'm not seeing pop-ups, but I see a okay. full slide. Okay, yeah. good deal. A TMDL determines the maximum amount of a given pollutant that can be discharged into a water body and still allow that water body to meet its goals. Maximum amounts of the pollutant are allocated or assigned to all of the sources, example point sources, non-point sources, and then the plan recommends implementation actions to meet reduction goals. As shown in this graphic, TMDLs are a continual process built upon watershed surveys and adaptive or flexible management. We start with assessing the situation, then develop a strategy, implement that strategy, but continue to evaluate and adapt the strategy as necessary. Now back to the Mommy Watershed Nutrient TMDL. If you are not already aware, we have a dedicated website that will continue to be updated regularly throughout the, the development and the implementation of this project. And because I have such a short window to speak today, there probably won't be time for questions. I will, however, provide you all with details on how to engage with us now and what that process is a little later in the presentation. To date, we have produced two YouTube videos that go into detail about Ohio's TMDL process, the differences between near field and far field TMDLs, and how the work performed so far puts the Mommy Watershed Nutrient TMDL into step three, the loading analysis plan or LAP phase. There is a third YouTube video that will be released tomorrow, September 9th, that will help describe a lot of the ongoing state-led projects to address nutrient reduction in the Maumee watershed, including efforts from Indiana and Michigan, as well as the plethora of research efforts through Ohio Sea Grant. The goal of this next module is to inform the stakeholders of all the existing nutrient reduction efforts happening while we are building the TMDL, which will not be final until late 2022. You can find links to these videos on our website or by going to Ohio EPA's YouTube channel. If you are on our listservs, you will continue to be notified of material distributed through email. The module two YouTube video elaborated on all the documents Ohio EPA determined to complete are step one and step two of our five-step TMDL process. At the posting of this video, we requested comments from the stakeholders and asked if there were any other documents and or efforts that should be considered. And I'd like to address some of the common themes. Feedback from many stakeholders included the fact that Annex 4 load targets to address Western Lake Erie HABs also includes dissolved reactive phosphorus or DRP. We are quite aware of the NX4 DRP load targets. However, the non-conservative nature of DRP means DRP loads are nearly impossible to track using the modeling methods that we have pr proposed for this project. This fact combined with the limited understanding of key pathways of DRP movement forces us to follow an adaptive implementation approach which will be reevaluated as soon as current research evolves. In coordinating with Dr. Laura Johnson, we do think there will be some ways to include DRP reduction efforts in this first iteration of the TMDL. And remember, TMDLs are living documents. This project will continue to be updated in order to meet Annex 4 DRP load targets. The Module 2 YouTube video elaborated on all the documents Ohio EPA determined to complete step one. Oh, did I go backwards instead of forward? Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. Once stakeholders have time to review Module 3, which overviews our ongoing nutrient reduction efforts, again being released tomorrow, 
It will discuss the iterative nature of planning, implementation, nutrient reduction tracking, and evaluating the research going on by our university partners and federal agencies at each step of this adaptive process. As soon as DRP research catches up to our TMDL, we will incorporate the findings into a revised TMDL implementation plan. Total phosphorus reduction practices are more easily performed and tracked and will be the initial focus of load reduction allocations. In addition, several stakeholders requested certain policy actions to address pollutants delivered from livestock farms, point sources, such as wastewater treatment plants and other sources. For instance, there are several reports on the number of livestock and the use of livestock manure in the Mommy watershed. We certainly appreciate stakeholders' concerns and interests in these issues. The TMDL itself will provide recommendations for pollutant reductions. However, these specific source reductions do not get included until step four, the preliminary modeling results report. Comments received so far will be fully considered when we reach this point in the process, but we are just not there yet. Where we are is step three, the Loading Analysis Plan, or LAP, which is currently out for public review. The LAP explains the following three important aspects of a TMDL project. It lists assessment units found to be impaired for a beneficial use, designation like aquatic life, recreation, and public water supply, how water quality restoration targets are set to directly address the recreation and public water supply use impairments due to HABs and are protective of aquatic life use impairments due to nutrients. And it proposes a modeling method for the TMDL loading calculations. The LAP is the link between impairment and restoration. And again, Please note that the actual nutrient allocations and recommended implementation actions do not occur until step four, the preliminary modeling results. We are proposing a mass balance method be used to assign TMDL allocations. However, we also plan to use model results from the Soil and Water Assessment Tool, or SWOT, to assist with verification of these allocations. SWAT has been run in the MAMI, simulating various pollution reduction scenarios that meet Annex 4 targets. We will compare the TMDL allocations to these scenarios in order to help estimate confidence of calculations. Every dot on this map represents tributary streamflow gauges where continuous nutrient monitoring is occurring by either Heidelberg or USGS. The state plans to track progress of nutrient reduction via these monitoring stations. This allows us to use observed, not estimated or modeled data to determine changes in future progress. The draft loading analysis plan was released on August 31st and is available for your review with a public comment period that's open until October 8th. We will also be holding a virtual outreach event on Tuesday, October 5th at two to explain the loading analysis plan and allow for questions and answers. This is the link to register, which is also back on our project website. We also had several commenters ask for more direct stakeholder outreach for the upcoming phases of this project. And we certainly want to make sure there is ample opportunities for stakeholders to understand and provide input. I will be working with the agency directors over the next few weeks to lay out an outreach plan for the upcoming fall and winter months to foster more collaboration prior to releasing the draft preliminary modeling results which really is the meat of the TMDL. 
Next, we'll discuss non-point source implementation strategy plans. Uh, we call them nine element plans for short. In the Mummy watershed, which are on a HUC 12 watershed scale. To date, we have 47 approved nine element plans, which are depicted in yellow and green. However, the green only have near field phosphorus reduction targets so far. The MAMI Area of Concern, or AOC, is working with its facilitating organization, Partners for Clean Streams, to update existing nine element plans in the green areas to include new stream data and new far field targets that were set out in Ohio's 2020 Domestic Action Plan. The AOC has received $50,000 from the Lake Erie Protection Fund for eight plan updates, $35,000 from a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative or GLRI pass-through grant for seven plan updates, and another $75,000 GLRI pass-through grant to the University of Toledo for five to seven more plan updates. We also have 14 plans depicted in dark gray under development by OSU Extension with far field targets, also funded through a pass through GLRI grant. And we know of others to be under development. So we think we're really close to getting about 33% coverage in uh, just a few months. As these far field plans have been approved over the past three years, Ohio EPA's non-point source program, along with Ohio Lake Erie Commission, have applied for several GLRI grants, resulting in numerous implementation projects that were developed as a result of these planning efforts. The first one is uh, Lake Erie Commission Domestic Action Implementation Grant, where they got eight implementation projects totaling $900,000 and their partners included Ottawa, Mercer, Allen, and Paulding Soil and Water Conservation Districts, Lucas County Engineers Office, City of Sylvania, Toledo, and the University of Finley. And these included things like two, two stream restoration and one wetland restoration project, agricultural BMPs, two-stage ditch restoration, and urban green infrastructure. Ohio EPA received a drainage water management grant for five implementation projects totaling 774,000. Our partners included the Village of Archbold, Mercer County Commissioners, Fulton, Putnam, and Mercer and Ben were soil and water conservation districts. And those had multiple grass waterway retrofits, wetlands, stream restoration, and two-stage ditch restoration projects. We, Ohio EPA has just recently applied for two applications for three projects totaling $1.2 million from the Great Lakes National Program Office where GLRI is held. This is for their federal fiscal year 2022 competitive grant and we have partnered with the city of Sylvania, Mercer County Commissioners and Lucas County Engineer's Office. Ohio EPA has also funded seven implementation projects through our section 319 funding. We typically allocate about $2.5 million a year in 319 funding. Our partners for these seven projects included Ottawa, Lucas, and Fulton Soil and Water Conservation Districts, two projects with the City of Toledo, and two projects with Lucas County Engineers. And I think the big point is it's clear that 319 and GLRI funding is available for implementation projects once the nine element planning process is initiated and projects are continually developed. And this is all occurring in the background while we are developing the TMDL. And if you have implementation projects developed through an approved nine element plan ready to go anywhere in the state, our 2022 319 grant request for proposals is out now. 
with applications due on October 18th. And for the third year in a row, I'm very happy to say that we have partnered with Ohio Department of Natural Resources, H2 Ohio funding to count towards complete local match, which means no 40% match required by the applicants as had been required in years past. So to summarize, Ohio EPA has committed to develop the Mommy Watershed Nutrient TMDL by the end of 2022. The third step, the loading analysis plan is out now with a public outreach event on October 5th. The expected release dates for the two final steps of this TMDL will occur in approximately March and October of next year. These are ambitious goals but we will make every effort to stay on schedule. The final step of the process will be to submit the TMDL to US EPA for approval by the end of next year. Stakeholder involvement is key to the TMDL process. The best way to be sure you receive information from Ohio EPA is to create an account and sign up for the TMDL listserv at the web address on this slide. You can also get to it from our uh, main TMDL pages. We currently have three options to sign up. One is a statewide TMDL, one's Ohio River Basin TMDLs, and one is Lake Erie Basin TMDLs. So any updates regarding this Mommy Watershed Nutrient TMDL project will be sent to the statewide and the Lake Erie Basin lists. We encourage everyone who wants to stay engaged, please register for one or more of these listservs. And with that, Chris and Kristen, I am done. Tiffany, thank you very much um, for your time here. We are pushing really close to switching over to the next. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate um, plenty of opportunities to engage with Tiffany since we don't have time for those questions now, but please, you know, look at that lap that's out for review, look for the public engagement effort that'll happen October 5th. It's nice to see that timeline for phase four and phase five that are basically March-ish of 22 and October of 22. Clearly that is a heavy lift. So I wish uh, EPA luck um, in that process. Um, so when I look at uh, the one, I had a quick question because I'm not seeing a ton pour in from the chat function. Tell me again, what, for what must you have that nine element plan for? So you have to have that nine element plan completed to be eligible for what? Can you help me out with that? I can try. I'm not the expert, but I certainly uh, have staff that are and uh, can refer you to them. But it is it is a planning tool that you have to have certain components uh, that need to be checked off. It, it involves a lot of local engagement. Uh, the big part of the nine element plan is local buy-in. We have to have local projects to enter into these plans so that implementation is, is more guaranteed. And it basically sets, they have targets and it goes through and allocates different types of practices to meet those project, those targets. Some nine element plans identify exactly which projects are gonna meet the targets and some just say um, uh, buffers in this area will meet the targets and then we'll figure out where to put them once we have funding. So those plans get reviewed and approved by my staff at Ohio EPA. And once they're formally approved, any implementation projects in the nine element plans are eligible for federal funding. They ha you have to have them for at least GLRI under the Great Lakes National Program Office or for our 319 program. I do not think, Chris, that they need to be uh, approved for the NRCS side of the house funding. Um, it's more the work that we do um, through the EPA and Ohio Lake Gary Commission. Thanks for that, Tiffany. Sorry to put you on the spot with that. That was no, great. great. So the only other things I'm seeing in the chat is basically one, seeing if people could get access to the PowerPoint. We've told them the recording will be on our website. And then John Bratton had a question about technical work related to the TMDL. But you know, um, other than that, we're, we're good to go. I want to stay on task here. So Tiffany, awesome. thank you for your time. This has been great. Thank you. Kristen, uh, I'm going to turn it back to you to introduce our next speaker. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Tiffany and Chris. Um, 
I am happy to introduce our third speaker um, in the second session, Tanya Williamson. Uh, Tanya is a research hydrologist at the USGS Ohio Kentucky Indiana Water Science Center. Um, Tanya's research interests includes hydrologic modeling of mixed land use watersheds, incorporation of soil physical data into those models, uh, temporal variability of soil water storage and movement, and conservation management in agricultural landscape. Uh, Tanya's talk title for today is Phosphorus Sources, Forms, and Abundance as a Function of Stream Flow and Field con Conditions in Maumee River Basin Streams. And Tanya, it looks like your, your presentation is up and ready to go. Don't think I can hear Okay, you. now, now can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, good, sorry about that. Okay, so no thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, and thank you to Tiffany for kind of uh, setting the stage in terms of looking at the basin upstream of the lake and really allowing us now to step into the streams. And so I'll be talking to you today about work that I'm doing along with a lot of my colleagues at the US Geological Survey. Uh, where I'm a research hydrologist with the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana offices. And so I'm going to talk to you about our monitoring within the Maumee River Basin. And currently we have 21 sites within Ohio and the Indiana and Michigan, at which we monitor for nitrogen, phosphorus, and suspended sediment, as well as continuous stream flow. And at these sites, we take weekly and storm samples. So it ends up amounting to about 100 samples per site per year. And we combine the concentrations that we get from individual samples times the stream flow in order to interpret a continuous load or amount of material that passes each of those sites. And a lot of these sites were put in place specifically to address a March 1 to July 31 period associated with harmful algal bloom severity. The sites run all year long but today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that specific period. And we're gonna talk actually for that period about flow weighted mean concentrations, where we take the total amount of material that passed each of those sites during that March through July period and divide it by the average stream flow in order to get an average concentration of milligrams per liter. And then after I finish talking to you about kind of a range of conditions in the basin, I'm gonna focus in on one of the tributaries. So, Looking at the Maumee, this gives you an idea of the distribution of the sites. And this is very similar to one of the maps that Tiffany just showed. And data collection for this uh, network began in 2015 and is ongoing. And we have 16 sites with at least five years of data. And one of the things I wanna point out is that the distribution of these sites, you can see their individual sub basins over here on the left. But over here on the right, I just kinda of wanna remind you that when we're talking about um, the, the Maumee River Basin, you know, as, as uh, Deanna mentioned, it's very uh, fine grained in general, but there are actually two relatively distinct ecoregions. And that is the glacial till that's above the ancient Lake Maumee shoreline, which is kind of shown by this very distinct feature boundary. And then the lake plain that lies in the lower elevations that's more poorly drained. The glacial till tends to be more easily eroded. So today to talk about just kind of the network, I wanna compare three headwater tributaries with three trunk streams. And we'll be focusing on these subsets here that I've shown you. And the largest stream we'll be talking about is the Maumee River near Defiance, which is 14,400 square kilometers. So here on the left, I'm showing you the cumulative stream flow and cumulative precipitation at that Maumee near Defiance site. Um, precipitation here on top. And you'll notice that I've got that 2019 year highlighted. And I just wanna compare these sites by looking at what we saw after the 2019 rain induced fallow, which many of you will remember for a lot of reasons, including talks last year, when about 29% of the cropland was fallowed, fallowed within the basin. And as a result, there was a 62% reduction in phosphorus application. And I should highlight that I'm mainly just gonna talk about phosphorus and sediment today although nitrogen is monitored at each of these sites. So when we look at these sites, the question can be, did all of them react similarly? So in comparing the headwaters to the trunk streams, again, we're focusing on that March 1 to July 31 period 
flow weighted mean concentrations, and we're going to look at a percent difference. So essentially values from 2019 minus 2017, then normalized or divided by 2017. Essentially a positive number means that 2019 had higher values, a negative number means that 2019 had lower values. And I've shown you, you know, the, the tributary is kind of highlighted in this hot pink color. And the first thing to see is that when we look at the, the mean stream flow volume that was passing each of these sites during that March to July of 2019 specifically, it was significantly lower, or it was consistently lower at these tributaries than it was at the larger streams. You see that the Maumee River at Antwerp, Auglis near Defiance, and Maumee River near Defiance all consistently increased in the stream flow during that period. But now when we look at dissolved phosphorus and total phosphorus, we see that there's, you know, variability depending on which site you're looking at. For example, there were decreases in dissolved phosphorus at uh, the Platter Creek and Little Flat Rock Creek sites that are small headwater tributaries, but there were increases in total phosphorus. And these two sites where there were increases in total phosphorus also corresponded to the, the largest increases in suspended sediment that we saw among all the sites. Notice that Black Creek near Harlan, which is actually our smallest tributary, and is the only one that actually drains uh, part of that glacial till, had a decrease in each of these. And then the final thing that I wanna drive home before we leave this slide is that even though there were increases in total phosphorus and suspended sediment at few of these sites, there was an overall decrease at the larger trunk streams, including at the Maumee River near Defiance. And so that tells us that the headwater tributaries varied, first of all, during this year. Um, and then especially for total phosphorus and sediment, but also that even though some of the tributary concentrations were up, the trunk stream concentrations were down. So in order to understand how that might've happened, we're now gonna step into just looking at Black Creek and we're gonna think a little bit more about site-specific data there. So Black Creek is a 32 square kilometer tributary. Again, it's a fifth order stream. And at this site, we um, integrate research both from an edge of field study site, which is shown here in the middle of the basin. It's actually right on that uh, ancient Lake Maumee shoreline. And we integrate that with information from the stream. We also uh, have fingerprinted suspended sediment in this basin. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that now. So the suspended sediment we fingerprinted as different sources, starting with four upland sources, forested, pasture, cropland, and road. And then we also included stream bank as a potential source because numerous studies across the Midwest and other parts of the US have shown that stream bank is frequently an important uh, contributor to what's carried as suspended sediment in the stream. So we essentially go to the field, to, to the basin. We looked at 15 sites for each, randomly distributed in the basin, and we sample the surface material. Then we uh, subset only the fine grain material for this um, because we only want to be looking at that size that might be suspended within the stream. So we're talking about 63 microns and finer, essentially silt and clay material. And we look at 49 metals in addition to carbon and nitrogen. And we put it in a mixing model. And for this set of data, for whatever reason, magnesium and thorium was the combination of elements that best separated these land use types just by themselves, two elements. But in reality, we end up using somewhere between eight and 12 element combinations in order to better differentiate the sources. And in order to know that this mixing model is working, we actually evaluate each source sample as well to make sure that we're getting good results. So the proportional breakdown, and that's an important feature here, this is only giving me a proportion for each sample of what its sources looked like. We collected uh, for 2018 water year, we collected fluvial sediment by putting a pipe into the stream. Essentially the openings to the pipe are just below the water at base flow. And so the water essentially goes into the pipe. It gets slowed down about 600 times. Suspended sediment drops out. The water can leave, but the sediment stays behind. And so you get this monthly aggregation or accumulation of material and then the, the sample is removed and we start again. So it is integrating stream flow during that month long time period. And when we look over here at this bar graph, the first thing you're gonna see is that you see a lot of blue, right? We've got the months down here on the bottom. We had to take the sample out for January and February uh, because uh, there was too much ice in the channel. And so I've estimated those from the, the months on either side, but you see that in general, 65% or more 
of the material in any month was identified as coming from stream bank. And that we, when we look at the stream bed, which I also sampled here, we see a similar amount. The second most abundant uh, source was cropland, which we see in almost every month. And over the course of the period uh, or of the study, we saw less than 1% either coming from pasture land or forested land in this basin. But we know that this is just proportional breakdown and really we need to translate it for those months that move the most sediment past the gauge. So what you're looking at here is that same graph, but now we've used it uh, and combined it with the amount of material, the amount of suspended sediment that moved past the Black Creek gauge during that 2018 water year. And so our largest load months at that site were November, February, March, and April. And just recall, February here is uh, estimated for March. Remember also that these data all include both events and base flow. I wanna look at these data slightly differently though. If you look at these blue triangles, these are the same graph as what you have on the other, um, in the other system. I've just altered the axis a little bit and that way we can actually look. So it's a logarithmic axis. So we can actually look at how much material was coming off the edge of field sites as we went through this water year. And you'll see it's temporally, it's a pretty consistent relation except for really these months right here where you had the largest loads coming off the stream that February, uh, March, and April. The other thing we have from this fingerprinting method though is we get the sediment phosphorus, sediment bound phosphorus for each of those source samples. And I just wanna um, highlight right now that at this point I'm talking about a complete digestion of um, sediment phosphorus. I'm not talking about, for example, the, the Malik three test that was discussed earlier. The a big thing I want you to notice is that if you, so we're gonna be talking about box plots, just as a reminder, this middle value is the median and 50% of the observations are in this box right here. And so the first thing to see is, you know, we've got stream bank in blue, cropland in orange, and you can see that uh, the concentrations of, uh, of phosphorus in uh, stream bank and cropland are actually relatively similar, which is, is sometimes surprising. And that's a, a big indication, you know, uh, it's already been mentioned how uh, phosphorus can be stored on the field as a legacy source, something that wasn't newly applied, but is left over from previous years. And this is just evidence that phosphorus can be stored in the stream bank as a legacy source. So now we're gonna estimate the amount of sediment bound P, sediment bound phosphorus that would have come with this suspended sediment that was captured at the gauge. And this is the graph we see here. So the colors should look very similar to what you were looking at on the left. But now you'll see that we've got that extra black behind it. This black bars are the particulate P as measured by the gauge. So we can also estimate sediment moved phosphorus or particulate phosphorus as the difference between total phosphorus and dissolved phosphorus. And so when we look at the total amount of total phosphorus and dissolved phosphorus going past the gauge, and we take that difference, we get these black bars. And so what that tells us that is that in these months with the largest amount moving, at least 200 kilograms of particulate phosphorus were, were unaccounted for during those months based on what would have come from the sources and the fine grain material specifically from those sources that we identified from sediment fingerprinting. So this just tells us that particulate P is being enriched as it moves through the system. Okay. So now if we really wanna understand that, we have to step away from loads, monthly totals, and we need to look at individual samples. So here we're gonna talk about data from water years two, 2016 through 2019, four years of data. And let's start by comparing just what uh, was sampled from the streams itself. We're gonna compare base flow samples, which is about 82% of the time at this stream relative to event samples, which are those high flow events that occur about 17 or to 18%. And so here on the right, you'll see we have a graph for total phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, and suspended sediment concentrations. And in each case, the concentrations in samples during events were significantly higher relative to those concentrations from base flow. And this is all at the Black Creek gauge. But recall that we also have an edge of field site sitting in the middle and use that as a representation kind of of what's going on in terms of active agriculture in the basin at any given time. 
And when we compare what we get in the stream during events to what we get, what we saw at the fields, we see that event flow from the fields was actually, or from the, the creek was actually pretty similar in terms of concentrations relative to what was sampled at the field itself. So if nothing else, this is evidence of the ongoing benefit of continuing with those different management practices that have already been mentioned today and continuing to protect those fields. But my goal is gonna to be to, to show you some months where it's even more important to be protecting the fields. So what about that particulate P I mentioned earlier? And this is really a, an ongoing research question that we have. And so in order to look at that particulate P, so that amount of phosphorus that's moving with sediment, what I did was I normalized it. And so we took that TP minus DP, right? So total minus dissolved phosphorus. And we divided it by the amount of suspended sediment moving during every, or captured with every sample. The idea that we're normalizing that amount of phosphorus for how it's moving. And what I wanna show you here, and this is this final fourth graph that just got added, is that essentially you see that the patterns are reversed here. Base flow is enriched relative to both the sources, which is shown here with this gray bar, but also relative to what is coming off in field runoff. And the events in general have a larger range and they're also significantly lower overall than what's captured during base flow. So that tells us that that relation between phosphorus and suspended sediment is different during base flow and events. So then the question becomes, you know, that is a very large range. What is driving that event phosphorus? So in order to do that, you know, we had essentially a range of samples from a lot of different events. In the end, it ended up being about 100 different events. So we went through and we looked at each and picked the sample that had the maximum total phosphorus concentration for that event and looked at how that related to both dissolved phosphorus and suspended sediment concentrations for that same sample. And so these are these insets here. These are the maximum TP samples. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about them. So again, each event was separated by at least three days from the next event. And we wanted to look at kind of what was that relation between the, the total phosphorus and the dissolved and suspended sediment with the idea that suspended sediment was telling us something about particulate. And I'm really only gonna talk because of time about the two end members, dissolved P driven storms, or suspended sediment driven storms. And by the end of the talk, if you're, you're kind of watching the slides go by, you're gonna see that there were some events where everything occurred in the same sample. I called those all, um, but it's looking like they're just basically another form of sediment driven event. So what's driving total phosphorus? Well, the first thing we see is if we look at the concent or the stream flow that was associated with each of these maximum total phosphorus samples, that stream flow matters. It was significantly lower during uh, dissolved phosphorus or DP driven events relative to those that were sediment driven. And so that might make you wanna say, well, maybe that's because precipitation is making its difference. But if we look at the amount of precipitation, whether it was intensity or the amount of rainfall that occurred before the event, we saw no pattern there. It's not precipitation. Then we looked at timing during the year. Both DP and sed driven events occurred in all months. But if we separate the year in terms of basically a growing period and a period during which the field's more likely to be uh, you know, uh, exposed because there's no crop sitting there, we see that most said and all events occur when those fields would be more likely to be exposed, meaning between October and April. The final piece of the puzzle was looking at antecedent conditions, which we were able to uh, examine using soil water or soil moisture from the edge of field site. And what we saw there was that what ends up as a dissolved driven storm, a DP driven storm, had significantly lower soil water content than those sediment driven storms. And then this all begins to make sense, right? If these sediment driven storms are occurring during months where there's not crop cover. That also means that evapotranspiration is lower, which means that there's less space to store new water as it moves into the soil and you get a bigger storm response in the stream itself. So one key thing there, that means that the field conditions, what's going on on the field can help us foreshadow what that stream response is gonna end up being. The other thing to circle back to is that recall that those are the same months when we saw the largest sediment loads in Black Creek. So all of these sediment driven events that we already saw are moving more 
and total phosphorus, for example, they're all happening at the same time. So then finally, to kind of finish up, how does sample phosphorus and suspended sediment relate to stream flow if we look at them independently? And so here, just to kind of look at where we are, we're gonna look at some box plots for each constituent and look at they, how they relate to stream flow. And so if we start here with total phosphorus, we see that total phosphorus was significantly lower during DP driven events and higher during suspended sediment driven events. And that then if we graph total phosphorus as a function of the stream flow, when that maximum TP sample was taken, we see that there's a significant relation to stream flow and it explains about 50% of the variability in total phosphorus. It's not a, a really high R square, but it is showing us there's a consistent relation. If we look at dissolved phosphorus, on the other hand, we see that dissolved phosphorus itself is higher during those events where it's driving total phosphorus and the suspended sediment is lower. But there is no relation to stream flow for dissolved phosphorus. The only commonality is that during an event, dissolved phosphorus was generally four times higher than base flow concentrations. So suspended sediment, we see that not surprisingly, suspended sediment was significantly higher during sediment-driven events, right? That makes sense. But we might be surprised to find out that although it is significantly related to stream flow, that's only explaining about 14% of the variability in suspended sediment. Now, granted, if you add all the sediment-driven events, the SEDs plus the all, we're talking about 72% of the events in this basin, most of the events, right? So it's key that we need to understand that. And Understanding that these events might be leaked to stream bank erosion, for example, is a great first step in that. Finally, what about that particulate signal that we are looking at? Well, the particulate phosphorus is significantly higher during those DP driven events and is lower when it's a suspended sediment driven event. The other thing is that it has an inverse relation to stream flow. The higher the stream flow, the lower the amount of phosphorus carried with those sediment particles. But even if we separate out those particulate phosphorus values as a function of stream flow, we see that there is a significant relation to stream flow, but it's only explaining about 18%. There's a lot more to learn there. And then if we look at those, TP, those DP events, there's no relation to stream flow. And that particulate phosphorus ends up reflecting basically base flow DP constant or particulate concentrations. So what? So let's go through kind of the whole thing and see where it leads us. So first of all, each of these constituents, total phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, and suspended sediment, they're all significantly higher during events relative to base flow. But the event samples where we have that maximum TP tell us that you can actually characterize these events based on what's driving the TP signature in this basin. So the DP events end up with four times the DP of base flow, but they actually have significantly lower total phosphorus relative to said events, which have higher stream flow, more stream bank erosion, more sediment, and more total phosphorus. But interestingly, that particulate phosphorus has different characteristics as a function of almost everything, right? Stream flow, event type. Stream flow suggests that the grain size varies among different event types. So there's a lot to learn there. Right, particulate P, although we calculate it as kind of this extra thing, you know, total phosphorus minus dissolved phosphorus, it's kind of the leftover piece of information. There's a lot hidden within it. It varies among base flow, DP events, set events. And what about when you get stream bed remobilized during an event, right? So each of these are a way that, that phosphorus is stored and remobilized within the system. So with that, uh, I'll just kind of leave you with a parting message of where we're going. I, Cause I spent a lot of time talking about one tributary, right? Uh, I, right now we're working on doing a similar analysis in Little Flat Rock Creek, which sits down in the Lake Plain so that we can learn more about the particulate P, the particle size variability among those, how much material might actually be stored in the stream bed of each of these. For example, in Black Creek, it's estimated that there's a year and a half of stream bank erosion stored in the stream bed itself, just sitting there waiting to be moved. Um, we're fingerprinting this and looking at its ages. So all of that together can help us look at that phosphorus absorption and desorption with that particulate and how that all works together. And with that, I will say thank you to everyone who's helped support this research and to all of my colleagues who have helped contribute.
Tanya, thank you for that. This is Chris. Uh, we're, we're over the time for questions. I will say that uh, Beth Levy had a question in there about cover crops. Uh, John Bratton from Limnotech uh, tried to answer that in the chat function. And then Jeff Reuter added another chat. So if, if, you, if you feel comfortable with uh, weighing in on those, that'd be great. Um, but we're going to move on to our right. final speaker. Thank you for that talk. It was phenomenal. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to our uh, final speaker um, of the second session for today. Um, we'll have a presentation by Terry Mesher, who is the H2 Ohio Western Lake Erie Basin Program Coordinator for the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, and I've seen it, quite a few questions come in related to the H2 Ohio program. So I'm sure many of us are excited to hear uh, this upcoming presentation. Um, Terry is going to give us an update on the H2 Ohio program, producer interest, practice implementation, and future plans. Well, thank you, Kristen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you confirm that I'm coming through and you can see my slides just fine? It looks great and I can hear you well. All righty, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to give everybody a brief update on where ODA is at uh, with our H2 Ohio program. Um, in general, if we look at uh, what ODA's objectives are through the H2 Ohio program, uh, we're looking to reduce nutrient losses from the agricultural cropland um, in the Western Lake Erie Basin and doing that through the, the implementation of strategic conservation practices. And when we looked at looking at the uh, overall reduction of nutrient losses, we wanna focus in on, on three primary program areas. Um, we wanna improve nutrient management, um, reduce reduce erosion through better erosion management, as well as uh, looking at some better water management across our project area. Um, when, we, when we started off the program, we identified, the state identified 10 conservation practices that had a track record to, to help us move on that. Um, of those, the soil testing and the nutrient management plan is, is probably the key. It's the foundation for our program. But we're also incentivizing uh, variable rate application for, for phosphorus, subsurface phosphorus placement, manure incorporation, conservation crop rotation, and cover crops. Those are really focusing primarily on erosion management. And then lastly, of the practices that we are currently offering, drainage water management to, to help reduce the overall volume of water coming off of some of our cropland. The, uh, the practices that you see here, Highlighted in green are, are the practices that we are currently offering uh, program incentives for. Um, the reason we selected these is uh, what's driving this whole conversation is, is the goal to reduce phosphorus loss by 40%. Um, we saw these first seven as, as being applicable to the majority of acres uh, across the, the Western Lake Erie Basin, across our project area. And to be perfectly honest, we felt that we had a lot of tools to get those started um, immediately. So really, uh, as we look at H2 Ohio and, and get up to the 30,000 foot elevation, we're looking at the voluntary nutrient management plan as the cornerstone or as the foundation for the program overall. Um, our goal here is to, we figured the easiest nutrients to eliminate the loss from were ones that weren't needed for crop production. So we're using the voluntary nutrient management plan to be critical of nutrient applications and to eliminate um, some of the, the nutrient applications, particularly phosphorus and nitrogen that are not needed. So uh, for any people that are any <clears throat> to be enrolled in uh, H2 Ohio, uh, the program participant has to develop, submit and follow a voluntary nutrient management plan. And that nutrient management plan has to be written to um, the Tri-State Fertilizer Guide recommendations or, or NRCS 590, the nutrient management standard that uh, the state of Ohio has developed. Um, if we look at overall funding um, through this current fiscal year, um, ODA has committed over $125 million um, to incentivize H2 Ohio practices in the 14 county Maumee watershed project area. And our original 14 county project area is highlighted there in green. Um, the dark green, I think, uh, represents the Maumee watershed. Um, that, that was where we started um, our program offering. Um, in addition, um, we're also developing plans to commit an additional $78 million through this, fiscal, through this state fiscal year and next 
to fund H2 Ohio practices in an additional 10 counties covered in blue. Um, with the addition of the 10 counties for the Western Lake Erie expansion, we're offering program incentives across the entirety of the Western Lake Erie Basin. So any acres that drain into the Western Lake Erie Basin um, going into next year will have an opportunity to participate in some H2 Ohio programming. Wanted to go through a little bit of a, a mall me watershed update, um, just for a little bit of program background. Um, H2 Ohio enrollment was announced in the Amami uh, watershed area in February of 2020. Uh, we started taking um, applications for the program at that point in time, and we took those applications through March 31st of 2020. So enrollment in 2020 um, totaled nearly 1.1 million acres of voluntary nutrient management plans. Uh, that represents nearly or a little over 43% of the total cropland area in the project area across all 14 of those counties. The graphic shows the, uh, the number, amount of uh, cropland acres signed up in the individual counties. And we had over 1,800 agricultural producers enrolled in the program. A um, Couple challenges obviously that 2020 presented were, were uh, the pandemic um, threw us a couple curveballs. The ability to get the program started off due to the pandemic was a little bit delayed. Um, but if we look at that, um, if we look at the annual enrollment in H2 Ohio from that initial uh, sign up period, well over 500,000 acres in, in variable rate um, application technology, over 300,000 acres in, in uh, phosphorus placement, and nearly 170,000 acres in manure incorporation. Um, so, to say the least, uh, the sign up that we had for H2 Ohio practices. Um, was, was quite a bit more uh, than what we had ever anticipated. Um, the H2 Ohio practices implementation began last fall and will continue into uh, this fall's harvest. So the numbers that you're seeing on the screen are pretty representative of what our signup has been for the program um, for, for crop year 2021, 2022, and 2023. <clears throat> Currently, uh, we're just wrapping up um, getting producer signatures on contract extensions uh, for the next two crop years. Uh, our, our initial um, contract was only for crop year 2021. Uh, that was what that was the uh, amount of practices that we could fund with our existing funds um, through the diligent work of uh, <clears throat> the legislature. We've got uh, some additional funds coming through for this fiscal year. So we just wrapped up signing extensions for practices for crop year 2022 and 2023. Um, producers will be able to add some additional practices to their contracts in 2022 and 2023. And ODA is also developing and a framework to allow for new enrollments for the 14 county project area for additional practices for 2022 and 2023. <clears throat> Where we're at right now with these is uh, uh, the process that we're using for these practices is they have to be in concurrence with the uh, voluntary nutrient management plan as a whole. Um, so, so for a field to be eligible for, say, the VRT or for the um, subsurface phosphorus placement, the voluntary nutrient management plan has to have a prescription um, for that field. Basically, we have to show that the phosphorus is necessary. And then once completed, the, the producer will certify that those acres have been placed or that practice has been completed. The local soil and water conservation district then verifies that and then makes the payment um, when it's all said and done. So we're going through and we're building the nutrient management plan. The producers are implementing the, ver the, the plan and verifying the practices that are completed. Then the, um, the, the soil and water districts are certifying those practices and making those payments. So to that end, also um, within what we're doing right now is we're also taking um, expanding the program to those additional 10 counties. Uh, we're calling this the Western Lake Erie Basin Expansion Plan. And again, that, that includes a sign up or we're offering a sign up for the 10 counties that are highlighted in blue. Uh, so the total cropland area across these 10 counties is about 1.6 million acres um, within the project area. Um, the 10 counties are, we're conducting a sign up right now uh, within those counties. Um, we're gonna roll this out um, for the expansion a little bit differently than we did in uh, 
in the Maumee watershed. I kind of um, coined the phrase that in the Maumee watershed, we kind of had a shotgun start where we had producers that were signing up for BMPs and developing their nutrient management plan all at the same time. That led to quite a bit more work than what it needed to be, number one, and, and to be perfectly honest, led to quite a bit of confusion on to, as to which practices could realistically be achieved on which acres uh, within the watershed. So for phase one um, with this Western Lake Erie Basin expansion, we are <clears throat> We began to sign up in the summer of 2021. We opened up enrollment on July 15th of this year, and we'll be closing uh, applications here in October. And those practices will be um, implemented through the spring of 2022. Then next spring, in the spring of 2022, we will have an a second sign up where producers can sign a three-year contract. And that's gonna be for all of the practices that we have through H2 Ohio for 2023, 24, and 25. Uh, the phase one, the applications are being accepted now, as I said a little bit earlier. The application deadline is September 15th for applications for VNM or for applications for the conservation crop rotation, the small grains, the overwintering cover crops. Um, if a producer is interested in a VNMP development only, uh, we will accept those applications until October 15th. Now, the implementation of these practices will begin in August of 2021 with the, the seeding of cover crops or the seeding of, uh, uh, of, of winter annual rye like or winter annual like rye or wheat um, and then run through next summer. So we're only having a one year contract in this phase one. And our primary focus for this phase one is to, to get the VNMP developed, get that nutrient management plan developed and submitted to the local soil and water district so that it can be reviewed and approved before we start going into signing up additional um, best management practices. <clears throat> Phase two then for the Western Lake Erie Basin will include all of the H2 Ohio practices offered in the Maumee watershed. So we're gonna do nutrient management plan implementation, variable rate phosphorus application, um, subsurface phosphorus placement, manure incorporation, conservation crop rotation, small grains and forages, um, the overwintering cover crops, as well as drainage water management. If we look at the expansion area, uh, I do not think we'll have as much interest in the drainage water management as we had in the original area. Um, the, the expansion area probably rolls a little bit too much for, for a whole lot of wide use of drainage water management. But the implementation for these practices will begin in, in next August, August of 2022, and then run through um, the 2025 crop year. <clears throat> um, as we look at it, um, our overall interest in the expansion area, um, we have roughly about 400 producers that have made applications to uh, our program right now, and we're somewhere in the range of about 400,000 acres total. Uh, we do have another two weeks of application before we start to uh, to, um, until we convert over just to take to taking applications for the uh, nutrient management plans, but we're we're pretty happy with the sign up progress so far within the Western Lake Erie Basin expansion area. Uh, lastly, and as we look ahead, uh, currently uh, the H two Ohio agreements in the Maumee watershed will expand um, in or will expire in twenty twenty three. Um, we're looking at developing uh, a plan for continuation of H2 Ohio programming within the Maumee, but one of the things that we wanted to do was make, uh, get a break and, and make any program adjustments overall between the 2023 and 2024 crop years. So those plans for what that additional sign up or what that additional program programming will look like in uh, 2024 and on are being developed now. As well, ODA also hopes to expand the program to other parts of the state in 2024, depending on available funds. If we look at our available funds that ODA has right now um, over this biennium, we have nearly uh, $60 million each of those years to put towards H2 Ohio programming. Um, our plans are right now to focus all of those funds for the next for this fiscal year and next um, into the Western Lake Erie Basin, either to the Maumee watershed and satisfying those existing contracts 
or into satisfying the applications that we're receiving right now. Again, that depends on sign up as far as how we actually obligate those funds. That's a that's a real quick quick look on where we're at with H2 Ohio. I probably sped through the program or the the uh, presentation a little faster than what I anticipated. But I guess the other thing I would say, given that I have the time right now, is that this is probably in my 20 years of working in the conservation field, this has been the first time where we've had a program that really looks strongly at uh, what's happening on the cropland, um, what we're doing, what producers are doing with, with commercial fertilizers, how manures are being brought in, um, and looking at the whole picture as far as that goes. So I'm really excited about where we're at. I will tell you that uh, um, this program is taking on a life of its own, a life of its own where uh, ODA is concerned. Uh, certainly this uh, program has, has outgrown and, and has, has exceeded any of our early program estimates or expectations as far as the overall interest in the program, um, the overall producer interest in the program, as well as uh, looking at the workload that we have at our soil and water conservation districts. It's, uh, it's been quite a program and it's it's uh, probably got us us uh, about stretched out to our max as far as program delivery goes. But it's it's an exciting time, and we look forward to keep on uh, pushing this ball and pushing this program forward. So, with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Terry, thanks very much for that. Um, I'm having some internet issues on my end, so I, I lost uh, the chat that was accumulated before I got kicked out. So I'm, I'm going to defer to Kristen to see if she can handle some of those chat questions that came in. Yes, hold on, there's quite a few. Um, one question that just came in was, um, how much more funding do you think H2 Ohio will need if it's going to continue expanding at this rate? I, I, Kristen, I think we got a little bit to learn on that end. I mean, I think one of the big things we wanted to do uh, with this initial rollout and given the focus on the Western Lake Erie Basin was probably to try to pull in as many acres as we could. Um, I think as we move forward, I think we're going to start to get a little more critical of what acres we bring into the program. Um, that said, um, right now we're our average commitment, you know, uh, is somewhere in the range of about forty dollars per acre. Um, so, how much is this going to take to 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 maintain that growth? Uh, I don't know that we've gone through that exercise at this point. I do know that we're, what we're looking for is we're looking to try to better focus our our funding and better focus. Um, what acres we bring into the program as we look ahead at trying to pull, um, <coughs> improve the overall program effectiveness and uh, to expand the program to different areas of the state. Good, thanks. Um, another question that came in actually from Deanna, our uh, plenary speaker for the, the second session. Um, can farmers use pop-up pea fertilizer if the soil test does not recommend P. Yeah, we've with our with our overall goal and trying to get as many acres in the program as possible. Um, well, uh, let me back up. One of our early thoughts were is if we are trying to achieve a forty percent uh, phosphorus loss, that reduction, we would need to affect a lot of acres. We'd have need to have a lot of acres in the program. So within that, for folks that have um, uh, a prescription on their acres of zero phosphorus, but are implementing a nutrient management plan, we have allowed for some minute amounts of phosphorus to go in as pop-up. I think what we've lim limited it to was, was somewhere in the range of, of uh, 10 pounds of phosphorus per acre uh, for rotation. So um, our typical rotations are probably, <coughs> excuse me, removing about 60 pounds of phosphorus on average per year or phosphate per year, I should say. And we thought that that allowance for the pop-up fertilizer was insignificant because we're still taking the overall soil test um, values and soil test levels in the right direction. Great, thanks. Um, I think we're all caught up with the chat questions that came in. Um, Chris, I don't know if there were any um, more related to this in the uh, questions from the sign up. 
Yep. So I'll get into those. And again, I, I dropped off for a little there with an internet issue. So if this was addressed in your talk, I apologize for it. Um, but we saw this, the, the 10 practices identified for Ohio in this region, and then seven were adopted. I know the wetlands, and I'm paraphrasing now, I know that wetlands fall under what the DNR has been doing. And we saw you know some talk about that. But what about the, the other two practices is what the question is here. And then um, what about how, how we might address legacy issues in farm fields? Um, I know when you when you don't apply excess fertilizer using some of the funded practices now, you're not creating new legacy fields. But are, are, any discussion about the two that are, are currently not being funded outside of wetlands and then uh, possible additions to address legacy? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, yes, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources is doing a lot of work within wetlands, um, developing water quality wetlands. And they're also using some of their H2 Ohio dollars <clears throat> to provide some additional incentives to uh, a, the Lake Erie CREP, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, to also uh, incentivize some, some buffers and some riparian buffers um, within the Lake Erie CREP. Um, for the other two, when we're talking about water management, um, we are use, doing the drainage water management, but we're also starting to look at other ways we can do drainage water management across the agricultural landscape. So we're involved with some discussions with both EPA and DNR about some runoff detainment and treatment systems. And then lastly, uh, one of the other things on there was, was the two-stage ditch concept. And we are working on that. Um, to be perfectly honest, the, the ability for us <clears throat> to, to keep ahead of all the other program interests right now has probably delayed us a little bit. But in our discussions there, what, what we're looking at is focusing in and working with um, the local county ditch maintenance programs um, to possibly convert some existing ditches that are on maintenance into uh, two-stage ditches. Because that uh, would definitely probably from a systems wise and from an overall installation standpoint, installation standpoint would be the, the simplest route to go. Um, <clears throat> plus there's already a, a given network there um, for the actual construction to be completed. Thanks for that, Terry. There's another one here. Um, it's a little off uh, the topic from what you addressed, but maybe, you know, since we have your audience here, if you can, there's some discussion about looking at carbon sequestration. So is any of the, the work that maybe ag is hearing from or looking at with uh, agricultural fields being used in carbon sequestration, how do you think that that might align with, you know, the H2 Ohio efforts and what's going on in the phosphorus space? I, I think there's an awful lot of those practices that will overlap. Um, we're, we're just starting to hear some of those about the carbon sequestration um, programs coming out through the from the egg retailer side. I know Nutrien um, and I think um, Cargill are all are all looking at program programs for carbon sequestration. So I do definitely see some overlap there. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think I'll I'll you know to be perfectly honest, kind of echo some of Deanna's. Uh, comments earlier, you know, we're, we're kind of at the front end or the bottom end of the learning curve on learning what management practices across the landscape are the most effective towards controlling phosphorus runoff. Certainly, we know some of the big issues, you know, soil test phosphorus is a big indicator, um, you know, looking at overall flow and, and water management across the across the rural landscape is a big factor. So those are some of the things that I think we're still going to be critical. Um, to looking at the practices that we are using and, and figuring out if there's a better way to go about doing it. Um, I think one of the earlier questions I missed on was, was dealing with, with uh, the legacy phosphorus. And I think that's one of the things as we look at programming in the future. You know, I talked about the H2 Ohio program in the Maumee um, in 2024, 2025, and 2026. I think that's what we will start to look at is targeting a little bit more of the, the legacy phosphorus fields. And to be perfectly honest, try to provide a program <clears throat> that incentivizes producers to get those fields enrolled into our programming. You know, if, if we're using the Tri-State Fertilizer Guide to develop the nutrient management recommendations, ultimately over time, we will bring those phosphorus levels down. But I also think we're gonna be in a position where we're gonna to wanna to look at those legacy fields and figure out some other options to address those. Uh, right now, we're, we're working with the, some folks in the research community to better understand the effectiveness of our practices overall, as well as um, working with Ohio State University and trying to identify what sort of things we can do to uh, address some of the concerns in those legacy fields or those high soil test phosphorus fields. 
Sure, that was great. And, and I know Jay won't toot his own horn, so I'll do it on his behalf. I know Jay has funding to work with some of those identified legacy fields and put some of the practices um, out on those fields and see how well they do at drawing down some of those those high soil test phosphorus fields. And uh, again, Jay, if you want to weigh in, great. But uh, um, one of those connections was actually going to the certified crop advisors and saying, are there any farmers that you know that have high fields that you would be able to approach? And so kind of using that you know, doesn't always have to have the academic, academic or the agency approach those farmers, but working with our certified crop advisors might be a way to identify some of those fields and some people that would be willing to, to be part of some experimentation. Um, I'm looking at, uh, let's see, I'm looking in the chat function now. Uh, Terry or Deanna is asking, where's all the money coming from for this program? Um, and then Jay answered that state of Ohio is funding the H2 Ohio program. And Danny followed up. It was followed in the last two state budgets. Yeah, so this has been something under our, 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 our governor, Governor DeWine, that really takes water quality seriously and really has used H2 Ohio to invest in, in that water quality across both ag and EPA and DNR and, and health in a lot of these aspects. So it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal program. I'm not seeing any more in the submitted questions uh, that were submitted ahead of time that relate to um, really the ag question that we're talking about right now. Um, there are some questions in here just at a high level, Terry, that I'll ask you. You know, there's a lot of attention by some of our attendees to, to you know, the manure and the CAFOS situation. Is there anything on a high response that, you know, the questions really are just talking about, you know, seeing an increased number of these animals in the watershed. And so maybe just a high level just Terry discussion or, or wherever you want to take it about, you know, how is ODA um, working with and, 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 and addressing um, the animals in, in the watershed? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> our primary, primarily, you know, as far as uh, programs go and regulatory standpoint, um, ODA is working with, with those um, livestock production facilities or those farms through the, the livestock environmental permitting program. Um, but but I will say this, you know, as we look overall, um, Ohio's guidelines and the way that we viewed um, phosphorus and, and manure uh, application recommendations, we've been using a phosphorus basis to determine our, our manure applications for quite some time. It's It's been since the early 90s that, that the state of Ohio started to use a phosphorus um, application rate instead of the nitrogen. Um, if I look at, at, at what we're doing within um, H2 Ohio uh, through the manure incorporation um, practice itself, um, the producer has to follow everything within 590. So that's essentially following the same things that a permitted facility would have to do. But they also have to apply that manure to ground that is at 50 parts per million on a Bray P1 or, or down in that agronomic range um, to receive the program incentives. Really what we're looking at the H2 Ohio, the manure incorporation practice to do is to do, one, do several things. One is to incorporate the manure, but it's also <clears throat> to try to achieve uh, a change in the timing of when that manure is uh, applied. Um, we wanna try to get it applied and use it as a nitrogen source in the spring after corn has has uh, already emerged from the ground. So we've got uh, folks that are side dressing standing corn with, with uh, liquid manures. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do is we were tying some of the small grains practices um, in to open up a, a nutrient application window in the summertime where we've got overall, <clears throat> we've got a lower opportunity um, for those nutrients to run off as well as, as uh, you know, getting that uh, manure covered up or get a cover crop or secondary crop in behind that. So in general, those are some of the things that we're doing <clears throat> from a program standpoint. But I, I would like to take the opportunity also right now just to, to talk about nutrients overall. Um, we've looked at this quite a bit at ODA. And uh, if we look at overall the Western Lake Erie Basin, um, looking at the livestock that's in the watershed, there's enough livestock in the watershed to, to satisfy the, the phosphorus consumption of about 20% of the cropland. Um, so, you know, overall, the number of animals that are in the watershed um, doesn't seem to be alarming. Um, so I think as we look forward in our programming, um, we're going to be looking more at focusing on better application, better application windows, um, reducing rates, um, some of those sort of things to, to reduce the overall impact of, of manure nutrients in the watershed. 
But the last thing I would say is, is and I mentioned it earlier, that, that this is our ODA and, and you know, the conservation um, partnerships first foray into uh, really looking and being critical of, of nutrient applications across the broad um, piece of, of agricultural land in the state. And one thing that uh, has come to me is that, you know, we can be critical of, of commercial fertilizer applications too. There's room there. Um, we've got some over application of commercial fertilizers. We have some legacy fields that are fairly high in phosphorus that, that have received nothing but commercial fertilizers over the years. So um, if we look at overall, the, the amount of, of uh, commercial fertilizer being used, um, the overall um, solubility of commercial fertilizers, I think, I think scrutinizing all the nutrients across the board in the same manner is probably where where we need to be to uh, oh, reduce the overall losses of, of nutrients, particularly phosphorus. And Terry, to, to, to build on that, thank, thank you for that. Um, when we think about it, as you said, 20 percent, uh, enough to provide 20 20 percent of the nutrients for the, the fields that are that are in production in Ohio. Um, with that, sometimes when I get to engage with the producers, it's it's not a matter of, um, it, it's finding the fields that have the soil test phosphorus to receive that manure. And so even though there is enough of that manure to go around that we could be putting it on more fields, I think some of that pinch point comes around the transport of that manure. Do you know if that discussion on incentives to help farmers haul that manure away or some way to eliminate that perceived or real barrier of the transport of that manure. Do you know if that's been a discussion that's been occurring or ongoing? Uh, certainly in the development of H2 Ohio, it's been, it's been central to our overall incentive rates that we're going to. I mean, uh, the largest part or, or one of the big things that went into setting our rates for the manure incorporation practice were, was the fact that we wanted to include some, some transportation costs in there. Um, so within the program, absolutely it has. Um, you know, if I look at overall on the research side of things, you know, going back over the last 10 or 15 years uh, and within the livestock community, there's there's been a continue continuous push on um, looking at ways where we can process manure, um, pull out the nutrients, get it into a, a drier form, maybe a more transportable form. Um, my experience over the last 20 years is that's probably uh, the economics will not allow that to happen overall. Um, that said, you know, as I look at it and I look at the bigger question for animal production, protein production, and the overall water quality, um, I'm coming to the conclusion that we really need to look at the production facilities themselves, go up in the buildings. And <clears throat> instead of trying to scramble a bunch of eggs and then descramble them, maybe we really need to concentrate on how do we break that egg and how do we separate the yolk from the whites right away? How do we separate the solids from the liquids um, as they're voided from the animal to avoid some of those um, extensive processing costs? But I, I, the conversations are pretty rampant across the board on developing that research and finding a better way to do that. And just to build on Terry, may, maybe I'm off on this, but I've heard from folks, the price per gallon is coming down in some of those technologies, but it's still not there as you alluded to. But also there's extra effort uh, that's required by that that producer to actually manage that facility and that sort of thing too. Um, and so again, it's, you know, that's time. And, you know, we all know time is money um, to hire on new staff to do that. So it's not just getting the, the cost per gallon per technology down, but also figuring out how do we fit that operation and that procedure within the lifestyle and the, and the time that a farmer has available. Um, yeah. We're right up at, go ahead, please. Oh, the, the only other thing I think is, is some of the advancements that have been made on the livestock side, particularly in manure. You know, if, if we look at overall from the, from the nutritional standpoint, um, <clears throat> the phosphorus content that's contained in a lot of these manures has, has fallen drastically over the last 15 years. Um, just as an example, you know, when Grand Lake St. Mary's, when the distressed watershed rules started in 2010, um, it was a given that that liquid swine manure from a finishing house would have somewhere around 30 to 35 pounds of phosphate for every thousand gallons. Um, you know, looking at their last um, three year average for all the samples that are submitted through um, Grand Lake rules, it's down closer to between 20 and 24. And some of the more recent um, numbers show that, you know, we're down sub 20 or below 20 pounds of phosphate per thousand gallons. So that's another part of the technology that 
a lot of times doesn't get as much focus, but certainly has has made big differences on the overall footprint land area that's required to utilize all of the nutrients coming out of some of these livestock production facilities. Thank you very much for that. We're at we're at two thirty, so I don't want to hold our speakers over too much. I know Tanya, you didn't have a lot of time for question, but I saw that those that came through the chat se session, I think you were able to answer. Um, thanks for those answers to Beth and to uh, John Bratton and, and Jeff Reuter. So those were those were great. Um, there is one last one here that came from Katie Stamler, and, and I don't know if you can see that, Terry, but basically cover crops. We're seeing a lot of conversion amongst farmers in Ontario to a fourth crop rotation. Um, so have you seen any uh, conversation in Ohio about uh, a fourth crop rotation? And then with that answer, Terry, we'll probably let folks go if you're still um, on, sir. I appreciate the question. I mean, really, you know, uh, I think, Chris, you touched on earlier, time is money. And at the end of the day, there's there's an economic reason why a vast majority of the producers in, in Northwest Ohio use a corn soybean rotation because it's about economics. At the end of the day, they've got bills to pay. Um, we have seen a lot of growing interest in, in, in wheat, bringing back some sort of a winter annual and then maybe coming back in with a double crop of beans or some other sort of forage. But those are kind of hit and miss. You know, it depends on the weather for that year as to whether or not that's a profit point. So uh, I would say that until we see some new markets for some of those different crops, um, I, we're going to struggle to bring that in because at the end of the day, economics are going to drive those decisions as well. Great. So that we're, we'll close it down. I, I want I want to thank you know my co-hosts for this, so Jay Martin, Greg Labarge, Kevin King, uh, Kristen Fussell, again the support staff that we have on here from OSU Extension, um, and, and Aaron Monaco does a heavy heavy lift for this. For those that you're on right now behind the scenes, she's making it all come together. So I want to thank Aaron Monaco uh, a lot. Reminder that we will uh, we have to save the date, so it's going to be September 7th of next year. Um, we would like to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. We'll see how that works. Um, but we have a lot of um, analysis to do between now and then because uh, usually, as Christian said, we get 200 or 300 folks in person and we've seen an uptick in interest virtually. So if we get now the same want to be there in person as we see via virtual uh, opportunity, we're gonna have our time finding a venue for this. So we'll do some investigation on the back end. The last thing I'll say in closing is when you get the follow-up to this, uh, this virtual meeting, uh, there'll be a survey for you to kind of weigh in on, on what went on and, and maybe possible future speakers. I will tell you that the Ohio Department of Higher Education Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative uh, that is funded by the state also, the annual report for that is, is going to be hot off the presses. We're just lining up some final quotes from the state agencies. Um, but when you see the, the follow-up to this meeting with a survey and, and thanks for your participation, we will get you a link for the Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative, again, funded by the Ohio Department of Higher Education. So with that, I'll pause to see if uh, Kristen or Jay, Jay Martin has anything to follow up on. I guess I know the survey link was just sent out um, during Terry's presentation. So I just urge everyone to, to complete that um, because it is it is super helpful for us. Thanks, and I saw Jay shake his head no, so we'll uh, we'll run with that. And again, I want to thank everybody for your time um, and your participation, and and have a great week.